Preface of the Elements of Ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Gonzalez. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenberger. Preface. The following primer, a first book of ornithology, has been called Third Book of Natural History because it is the third of the series and, like its predecessors, is only designed to initiate those who wish to study this very interesting branch of natural history. It presents a general and almost synoptical view of the subject and will be found, I hope, to facilitate the studies of those who may wish to learn. It merely points the way to most extended knowledge, to acquisition, of which must always depend more the inclination and industry of the student, than upon the facilities he may possess. The homely comparison of the horse leads to the stream may be referred to as illustrative of the necessity for the process of zeal and industry in order to acquire knowledge. The mere possession of the very best books will be of no use, will impart no information, unless they referred to, read, or study. Teachers who are so disposed will find in these pages ample opportunities of pointing out to those they instruct the beautiful adaptation of organization of every living thing to the mode of life it is designed to observe the kind of food upon which it was pre-ordered it should live to point out or even allude to this universal adaptation of everything in nature to the purposes for which it was designed by the beneficent creator would have carried us beyond far our limits and injured our design of presenting in a very short space as many facts as possible without obscuring the view of the division arrangement or classification a knowledge of which it is the great object of these little books to teach yet this can be advantageously done verbally by every teacher and his pupils would soon learn that once becoming acquainted with the general anatomy and physiology of an animal whether it walked upon the dry land, float through the air, or seek the ocean depths, its mode of life and general habits are immediately discovered. This fact will become more clearly manifest as we proceed in the series, and in the end, the student will comprehend how geologists are able to deduce not only the habits of the animal, but also the form of the animal itself, by the examination of only a few of its bones. Although the works of M. M. Edwards and Comte are the chief sources from which the materials of these primers have been derived, others have been freely used, and the classification and arrangement of the great Cuvier have been strictly adhered to. With a view of assisting the student in understanding and remembering the systematic names, the etymologies have been added in the glossary. And inasmuch as all persons who are desirous of studying natural history are not acquainted with latin and greek languages the words from the latter have been given in italics in preference to using the proper greek characters and the omega where it occurs has been designated thus it is not designed that the questions at the foot of the page shall be answered by repeating the text from memory the pupil should be able to give the facts in his own language and show he understands the subject. The plates were engraved by Mr. G. Thomas, No. 37, South 3rd Street, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, April 15, 1842 End of preface Recording by April Gonzalez in Cavita, Philippines Lesson number 1 the Elements of Ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert J. Eckrich. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 1. The class of birds comprises all vertebrate animals that are best organized for flying. They are readily distinguished by the general form of the body and by the feathers with which they are covered. But the most important characters possessed by them consist in the structure of their internal organs and the manner in which their various functions are performed. In fact, they are oviparous vertebrata, 
in which the circulation is double and complete. The heart has four cavities. The blood is warm, and the respiration is aerial and double. To distinguish them from other vertebrate animals, it is only necessary to say that they have a complete circulation and a double aerial respiration or simply to remember that they are the only oviparous vertebrata having warm blood. The general form of birds varies very little, and is in relation to the mode of locomotion which is peculiar to them. They rarely attain a very large size, and their abdominal or posterior extremities are especially designed for standing and walking, while the thoracic or anterior extremities never serve them for walking, nor for prehension, nor for touch but they form a sort of broad oars named wings, which, by striking the air, sustain and cause the animal to move in it. The skeleton, which determines the general form of the body, and which is, at the same time, one of the most important parts of the apparatus of motion, is composed of nearly the same bones as that of the mammalia, but their form and disposition vary. The head is small, the bones of the cranium are soldered together at an early period of life, and the face is formed almost entirely by the jaws, which are very much elongated and constitute a beak. The superior mandible, or jaw, is articulated with the cranium in such a manner as to allow some mobility, and the lower mandible, in place of being articulated directly with the cranium, as is the case in mammalia, is suspended from a movable bone called the square or tympanic bone, which is articulated with the petrous bone. This mode of articulation of the lower jaw is met with also in other oviparous vertebrate animals, that is, in fishes and reptiles. These mandibles are composed of many pieces, and are enveloped in a horny substance which takes the place of teeth. The articulation of the head with the vertebral column is more movable than it is in mammals, and is affected through the means of a single rounded eminence called condyle, while in the mammalia there are always two of these condyles. This arrangement enables the bird to direct his face entirely and completely backwards. The neck of birds is also very movable, and as these animals generally take their food from the ground with their beak, the length of this part of their body is necessarily in proportion to the height at which they are placed on their legs. This is indeed almost always observed. The number of cervical vertebrae vary much. Most generally, there are 12 or 15, but sometimes we find a much larger number, and at others, not so many. The swan has 23, and the sparrow only 9. These bones are always very movable on each other, and from the disposition of their articular surfaces, the neck may be bent like the letter S and consequently be elongated or shortened accordingly as the curves are diminished or increased the bony frame of the trunk is very solid in birds that fly and with the exception of very few they all possess this difficulty the vertebrae of the back which necessarily support the ribs and consequently afford a point of support for the wings are entirely immovable and are frequently ankylosed that is soldered together the lumbar and sacral vertebrae are all united into one bone, having the same uses as the sacrum in the mammalia. Finally, the coccygean vertebrae are small and movable. The last one, which sustains the large tail feathers, is ordinarily larger than the others and marked by a projecting spine or crest. The ribs of birds also possess some peculiarities of structure which tend to increase the strength of the thorax. But the most remarkable part of the bony frame of this division of the body is the sternum, which, affording points of origin for the chief muscles of flight, becomes very much developed, and constitutes a broad shield or breastplate, which extends far back over the abdomen, and almost always presents a sort of very prominent and longitudinal crest or keel, called brisket. It is remarked that this shield is most developed and most completely ossified in those birds that fly best. The bones of the shoulders are disposed in a manner most favorable for the power of the wings. They are three in number, namely a scapula, a clavicle, and a coracoid bone. 
The scapula is much elongated. The clavicle is ankylosed with that part of the opposite side so as to form a bone resembling in shape the letter V, the point of which rests against the sternum. The coracoid bone, or posterior clavicle, is a sort of second clavicle, which, in the mammalia, is rudimentary and confounded with the scapula, but here becomes very strong, constituting a buttress placed between the articulation of the shoulder and the sternum. These double clavicles maintain the shoulders apart in spite of the violent force applied in a contrary direction by the exercise of the wings, which is greater the stronger the flight. The wing of the bird corresponds to the anterior extremity of mammals, and is also composed of three principal parts, namely the arm, the forearm, and the hand. The arm consists of a humerus, which is not particularly remarkable. The forearm, which consists of a radius and an ulna, corresponds in its length with the strength of the flight of the bird, and the hand is reduced to a sort of stump, which serves for the insertion of the large feathers of the wing. There is distinguished a range of carpal bones, a bone in the form of a style which represents the thumb, a single metacarpal bone which sustains a finger with two phalanges, and the vestiges of a third finger which is represented by a small styloid bone. The lower extremities of birds are designed solely for support and for walking. Sometimes they become the organs of natation, and there are some of these animals that employ them for the prehension of ailment. The bones of the haunches are strongly developed. They are attached to the neighboring part of the vertebral column so as to form with it a single piece, and the bony belt which results from this assemblage, and which is called the pelvis, remains almost always incomplete in the front. The femur is short and directed forward. The tibia is strong, and the fibula is reduced to a mere bony style. The tarsus and metatarsus are represented by a single bone, the length of which determines the height of the bird on its legs. The number of toes varies from four to two. Almost always there are three directed forward and one directed backwards. The number of phalanges ordinarily increases from two to five, from the hind toe or thumb to the fourth toe. We therefore count two phalanges for the thumb or great toe, three for the internal toe, four for the middle toe, and five for the external. In swimming birds, the toes are palmet, that is, united by membranes sufficiently broad to allow them to separate from each other and, when spread, to form a sort of paddle. In those that climb best, two toes are directed forward and two backwards. And in those that wade in rivers, marshes, etc., in search of fishes or worms, the tarsi are so long that the animal seems to be mounted on stilts. In all these animals, there is a peculiar mechanism, by means of which, when they are perched on a branch, the weight of the body tends to flex their toes, and, consequently, to make them closely embrace the object in their grasp an arrangement which permits them to repose in the standing position without any risk of falling while asleep. The feathers with which the body of birds is covered serve to protect them against cold and damp, and they are also powerful means of locomotion. They are composed of a horny stalk, hollow at the base, and armed with beards, which themselves have still smaller beards upon them. They are formed by secreting organs which are analogous in their nature to those which produce the hairs in mammalia. The secreting organ destined to form a feather is called a capsule and often acquires considerable length. According to the observations of M. F. Cuvier, it would appear that the capsule grows during the whole period occupied in the development of the feather and that in proportion as its base elongates, its extremity dies and becomes dry the moment it has formed the corresponding portion of this appendix. Each of these little apparatuses is composed of a cylindrical sheath lined internally by two coats or tunics, united by oblique partitions and a central bulb. The substance of the feather is deposited on the bulb, and to form the beards is molded in some way in the spaces that the little partitions we have just mentioned leave between them. In the portion corresponding to the stalk, the bulb is in relation with the internal surface of the stalk, and 
after having there deposited a spongy substance it dries and perishes but at the part where the stalk or trunk of the feather is tubular the lamina of horny matter which the secreting organ deposits is shaped or molded around itself and is completely enveloped in it nevertheless the bulb after it has discharged its functions dries and forms in perishing a series of membranous cones lodged one in the other like a nest of boxes which fill the interior of the tube and are called the sole of the feather or quill the new feather is at first enclosed in the sheath of its capsule which frequently projects several inches beyond the skin and is gradually destroyed the feather then appears naked and its beards display themselves laterally the extremity of its tube remains bedded in the skin but is generally detached without difficulty and at certain period falls to give place to a new feather this renewing of feathers which is called molting occurs in general every year after the season of laying and sometimes it takes place twice a year in the spring and the autumn it happens earlier in the old than in the young and is a period of indisposition during which the bird usually loses its voice the form of these tegumentary appendages varies much some are destitute of beards and resemble the spines of the porcupine others have stiff beards which are armed with smaller beards which hook into each other so as to form a great tissue or coat which the air does not penetrate others again have the beards and smaller beards barbs and barbules long flexible and not hooked into each other which renders them extremely soft and light and there are some which resemble simple down their colors are infinitely varied and often surpass the most beautiful flowers or the most brilliant gems in beauty and splendor generally the plumage of the female is not so rich as that of the male and it is rare for the young bird to be clothed in the same colors that it will wear all its life they often change two or three years afterwards and sometimes the adult wears a plumage in the spring altogether different from that of winter the large stiff feathers that grow on the anterior extremities of birds which are called wing feathers or pinion feathers expand these organs very considerably without increasing their weight and convert them into powerful oars destined to cleave the air and strike against it with so much force and frequency that the shock thus produced impels the body of the animal in a contrary direction the ability of the bird to sustain itself in the air and move with rapidity is in proportion to the expanse of the wings the feathers that contribute most to the extent of the wings and that are most useful in flight are those which are attached to the hand and consequently most distant from the body they are always ten in number and are called primary remages the feathers of the forearm are called secondary remages the scapulary which are the least in strength are attached to the humerus the buzzard feathers are those that grow from the thumb and the covaris those feathers which cover the base of the remiges every time a bird wishes to strike the air he first raises the humerus with the wing still folded next he expands the wing extending the forearm and hand and then suddenly depresses it the air which resists this movement now affords him a point of support upon which he rises he launches himself forward like a projectile and the moment an impulse is given to his body he folds the wing to diminish as much as possible the new resistance which the ambient air opposes his course this resistance and the attraction of gravitation which tends to cause all bodies to fall towards the center of the earth gradually diminish the swiftness the bird has acquired by his blow or stroke upon the air and if he has made no new movement he must soon descend but if before losing the swiftness acquired by the first blow of the wing he gives a second he will add a new impulse to that which he has already and gain an accelerated movement such is in fact the mechanism of flight while the bird is thus suspended in the air the whole weight of his body is supported by his wings and to enable him to preserve his equilibrium in this position the center of gravity must be placed very nearly beneath the shoulders and as low as possible it is for this reason that while flying he generally carries his head in advance by stretching out the neck 
and that the body, instead of being elongated like that of mammals, is always gathered up and oval. In this necessity for lowering as much as possible this center of gravity, we also find the reason for a peculiarity of structure which at first sight appears singular. The principle of elevating muscles of the wings, instead of being placed upon the back, as is ordinarily the case in other animals, are found upon the chest with the depressors, and they produce an effect opposite to the latter, because their tendons pass over a sort of pulley before reaching the humerus. This arrangement is injurious to their action, but it has the advantage of accumulating at the most depending part of the thorax all the most weighty organs of the body and, consequently, lowering thus far the center of gravity. It is evident that the resistance of the air is in proportion to the mass of this fluid, struck at one time by the wings, and, consequently, that the greater the surface of the wings, all things being equal, the greater will be the swiftness acquired by depressing these oars. Hence, it follows that birds with long wings are not only able to fly with greater rapidity than birds with short wings, but they are also able to support themselves for a longer time in the air, because they are not obliged to repeat the movements of these organs so frequently, and therefore do not become so readily fatigued. And, in fact, all birds remarkable for rapid and long sustained flight have large wings, while those that have short or moderate wings, compared with the volume of their body, fly less swiftly and require rest more frequently. To rise vertically, it is necessary that the wings of the bird should be entirely horizontal, but this is not ordinarily the case. In general, they are inclined from front to rear, so as to impart to the animal an obliquely ascending movement, Sometimes even this inclination is such that, to mount nearly vertically into the atmosphere, the bird is obliged to fly against the wind. The length of the remiges influences the facility with which he can rise in a calm air. Birds that have the anterior remiges longest, and most resisting at their extremity, fly more obliquely than those in which the wings are truncated at the end. The feathers of the tail also assist in flight, but in a different way. The bird makes use of them as a rudder to direct its course. The number of the feathers which perform this office is ordinarily twelve, and they are called reticies, and the name of coverts of the tail is given to those feathers which cover their base. We have seen that during flight the center of gravity of the bird should be near the shoulders. In order that he may preserve his balance on his legs, which are placed near the posterior part of his trunk, these organs must be flexed considerably forward, and the toes must be sufficiently long to be in advance of the point where the vertical line should fall that passes through the center of gravity, or the center of gravity must be carried behind so as to be above the base of support. This explains the utility of the great flexion of the thigh and the obliquity of the tarsus on the leg. When the foot is large and the neck can be bent so as to carry the head behind, the equilibrium is thus established without the body being thrown much out of the horizontal position. But when the neck is short and the toes of moderate length, the animal is obliged, while standing or walking, to assume an almost vertical position. It is for the purpose of more easily preserving their equilibrium that birds generally place their heads under their wing while they sleep perched on one leg. In most of these animals, this position is rendered singularly commodious by a peculiarity in the structure of the knee. In man and most mammals, the extremities bend under the weight of the leg the moment their extensor muscles cease to contract. And it is continued contraction of these organs that renders standing so fatiguing. But in the stork and other birds with long legs, it is otherwise. The lower extremity of the femur has a hollow or excavation which, during the extension of the limb, receives a projection of the tibia, which cannot escape from it without a muscular effort. The leg, once in position, it remains extended without the animal having any necessity to contract his muscles, and without his experiencing any fatigue. The sense of touch in birds is necessarily dull, on account of the nature of their integuments. The sense of taste also appears to be obtuse in most of these animals, and, in fact, their tongue is almost always hard and horny. 
in general, the same is true in respect to the sense of smell. Sometimes, however, this sense appears to be very delicate, for we observe that birds of prey direct themselves by odor alone to carry on, placed at too great a distance for them to perceive it, notwithstanding the great perfection of their sight. Generally, this last sense is more developed in birds than in all other animals. There is found at the back part of the eye a plated membrane, called pectin or marsupium, which projects from the retina toward the crystalline lens, and seems to be of a nervous nature. It is also remarked that the anterior face of the ball of the eye is strengthened by a circle of bony pieces lodged in the thickness of the sclerotica, and besides the two ordinary eyelids, there is always at the external angle of the eye a third named membrana nicotins, wrinkling membrane, which may be drawn over the front of this organ like a curtain. Birds have not, like most mammals, an external ear. Nocturnal birds only have a large external concha or pavilion, but it is not projecting, and the opening of the ear is generally concealed by feathers with fringed beards. The brain is less developed in birds than in most mammals, and differs from that of the latter in some important particulars, which we cannot enumerate at this time. Finally, to conclude with the functions of relation, we will add that in birds the voice is chiefly formed in the inferior larynx, which is situated at the extremity of the trachea, where it bifurcates to form the bronchia. In the singing birds, this organ is very complicated in its structure. We observe elastic membranes stretched in the interior and a great number of muscles designed to move the solid pieces that compose it, but in those birds that do not modulate sounds, its structure is much more simple. The organs destined to perform the various functions of nutrition are nearly the same as those in the mammalia. The apparatus of digestion in the class of birds presents the greatest uniformity of structure. The most remarkable part of it is the existence of three stomachs. Teeth are never found in these animals. Their aliments, which are taken hold of by the beak, are generally swallowed without being divided, and do not sojourn or pass in the mouth, as is the case in mammals. They have no veil of the palate, vellum palati, to close this cavity behind during mastication. The form of the beak varies much, and is always in relation to the nature of the food made use of by the bird. For this reason it affords excellent marks or characters for the classification of these animals. Sometimes the upper mandible is hooked and fitted for tearing flesh. At others the beak is short, straight, and stout, suited to breaking grains. At other times again it is wide and very open to enable the bird to seize easily in its flight those insects upon which it is destined to feed. The tongue is slightly fleshy and covered with horny papillae which serve to retain the food after it has entered the mouth. The os hyoides, or hyoid bone, which supports this organ, is very much elongated and terminates in two long, delicate horns which curve around the posterior and superior part of the head, their length depending on the extensibility of the tongue. The salivary glands are less numerous than in the mammalia. They are placed beneath the tongue and are formed of small round grains or granules. Generally, the saliva is thick and viscid. The esophagus descends along the neck and generally presents at its inferior part a considerable dilatation called the crop of ingulvies. This pouch constitutes a first stomach which projects above the clavicles. It is very large in granivorous birds and is met with in the rhapses or birds of prey, but it is wanting in the ostrich and in most perseverous birds, and particularly in those of the order of galatgrii. Below the crop, the esophagus becomes narrow and enters the thorax. Soon after entering the thorax, it again dilates to form the second stomach, called the proventriculus or bulbus granulosus. This cavity is remarkable for the great number of follicles which are lodged in the thickness of the parietes and which secrete an acid liquid, the gastric juice, designed to affect digestion. This ventricle is much larger and more numerously supplied with glands in those birds that have no crop than in those that are provided with it. Internally, it opens into a third stomach, the gizzards, which is of globular form and which varies in structure according to the diet or food of these animals. 
In granivorous birds, its muscular parietes are very thick and strong, and it is lined inside by a kind of thick, hard epidermis which resembles horn. In diurnal birds of prey, on the contrary, it is very thin, and in some aquatic birds, such as herons and pelicans, it forms but a single sac with the second stomach. The intestines of birds are not so long, generally, as those of the mammalia. In most of these animals, they are only two or three times the length of the body. The intestinal canal is divided into two portions, namely, the small and large intestine, and near the anus it has two appendices, terminating in cul-de-sacs, called cecums. The small intestine communicates with the gizzard by the opening of the pylorus, which is situated very near the cardia and is without valves. The bile is poured into this intestine by two ducts, which alternate with two or three canals, through which passes the pancreatic juice. The secreting organ of the bile, the liver, is generally more voluminous than in mammals, and is divided into two nearly equal lobes. The gallbladder is ordinarily large, but in some birds, such as the parrot, it is entirely wanting. The pancreas are also large, and are found in the first fold formed by the intestine. The cecums vary in length. In the granivorous and omnivorous birds, they are generally thick and long. They are wanting in most of the diurnal birds of prey, but in the nocturnal birds of prey they are, on the contrary, very large. The large intestine is very short, and terminates in a dilatation called the cloaca, which receives the urine as well as the eggs. The chyle, derived from the digestion of food, is absorbed by the chyliferous vessels, which unite with the lymphatic vessels of the extremities to form two thoracic ducts, which mount in front of the vertebral column and empty into the jugular veins near the heart. The blood of birds does not contain circular globules, like that of mammals, but oval globules, like those contained in the blood of reptiles and fishes. These solid particles are more abundant in birds than in other vertebrate animals, and the temperature of this liquid is higher than in the mammalia, which are, nevertheless, warm-blooded animals. The circulation is carried on in the same manner as in the mammalia. It is double and complete, that is, before reaching the point from which it departed, the blood passes through two systems of capillary vessels, and all the venous blood is changed into arterial blood. The heart has four cavities, namely, one ventricle and one auricle placed on the left, and the same on the right side. The blood is forced by the left ventricle into the aorta, which distributes it to the capillary vessels of all parts of the body. This liquid then returns to the heart through the veins and enters the right auricle, which forces it into the right ventricle, which is situated beneath it. This last cavity, by contracting, sends the blood to the lungs through the pulmonary artery. From the pulmonary artery, the blood passes into the capillary vessels of the lungs, where it is changed into arterial blood. Then it enters the pulmonary veins, and passing through them, reaches the left auricle. Finally, the left auricle pours it into the left ventricle, once we have just seen it go forth to be distributed to all the organs. Birds are distinguished from all other vertebrate animals by their mode of respiration, which is aerial as it is in the mammalia and reptiles, and it takes place not only in the lungs, but in the substance of all the other organs. In the mammalia and in the reptiles, the bronchii terminate in little cells, which end in a cul-de-sac, and the air that enters the lungs cannot pass beyond them, while in birds, the bronchii and pulmonary cells communicate with the great cavities, and this liquid, in this manner, penetrates to all parts of the body, even into the interior of the bones and feathers. These cavities, by means of which the air is distributed to the different parts of the body, are formed of very thin laminae of cellular tissue and are designated under the name of aerial pouches. Consequently, the blood comes in contact with the air in passing through the capillary vessels of all the organs, as well as in passing through the capillary vessels of the lungs, and we might say that the respiration of these animals, as well as their circulation, is double. A bird consumes proportionably more air than any other mammal, and perishes more rapidly when its respiration is interrupted. The cavity of the thorax, 
which contains the heart and lungs, is not separated from the abdomen by a complete muscular petition, as in the mammalia. The diaphragm is rudimentary, and only occupies the sides of the body. But the lungs are adherent to the ribs, so that they are forced to dilate when these bones separate from each other. Therefore, the movements of inspiration and expiration are performed nearly in the same manner as in the mammalia. End of Lesson 1 Recording by Robert J. Eckrich Germantown, Maryland, USA Lesson 2 of The Elements of Ornithology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenberger Lesson 2 Eggs, Incubation, Nests, Migration, Classification Habits of Birds Birds, like reptiles, fishes, and most of the invertebrate animals, that is, without vertebrae, are oviparous, that is, they lay eggs from which their young are hatched. The egg is first formed in an organ named ovary, and descends from it through a long tube called oviduct. It consists at first of a membranous sac filled with yellow matter and is not surrounded with the white till it reaches the oviduct, where it receives a more solid envelope which becomes encrusted with a calcareous matter that constitutes the shell. Upon the membrane of the yolk, or yellow matter, we perceive a whitish point, which, in the course of its development, becomes the young animal, for the nourishment or protection of which all the other parts of the egg are destined. In order that the young bird may be developed in the interior of the egg, it must be maintained at a certain degree of heat. In very warm countries, the heat of the sun is sometimes sufficient to bring about this phenomenon, and there certain birds abandon their eggs. But in most cases it is altogether different, and both parents or the mother alone maintain the necessary heat by sitting on them. The duration of incubation or the time required by the young bird to become developed in the interior of the egg varies in different species but it is the same in all birds of the same species it is from forty to forty five days for swans twenty five days for ducks twenty one days for hens from twelve to fifteen days for domesticated canary birds and only twelve days for the hummingbird almost all birds construct a nest to receive their eggs and to serve as a dwelling for their young, which, during the early period of life, are unprovided with feathers, extremely delicate, and incapable of moving, and of feeding themselves. Generally there is displayed in these structures an art, an adroitness, and an elegance which excite our admiration and one thing not less surprising is the regularity with which all the successive generations perform the same tasks and build nests exactly alike even under circumstances which prevent these animals from seeing and taking lessons from their parents a wonderful instinct guides them and induces them to take many precautions all the utility of which they cannot anticipate or appreciate beforehand the form arrangement and placing of the nest vary for almost every species of bird that which is constructed by the largest birds of prey rests upon a flat surface afforded by some part of a rock or on the platform of some tall tower its extent is very considerable and every year contributes to its increase for it is rare for these birds to abandon their first monument of maternal tenderness those that leave it return periodically to lay their eggs. This nest is frequently composed of such stout pieces of wood that one would scarcely believe they could be carried by a bird if he were not aware of the extraordinary strength of their muscles. They are so arranged as not to yield readily to the force of the wind, and they support boughs which are bound to each other by the remains of food and of excrement, 
forming a solid habitation bearing the name of airy those species that in the construction of their nests only employ rushes and reeds accumulate them in such quantities and fix them so firmly to the platform that rains or storms seldom cause their destruction most birds build their nests in the bifurcation of the branches of trees in this case bits of straw and small pieces of wood carried in the beak tied and interlaced by means of this organ and the aid of the foot constitute the external frame which supports the moss and down that form the bed some species have the habit of suspending their nest which is wrought in a still more artist-like manner to the extremity of a flexible twig so that in obedience to every impulse of the winds this cradle and the sitting burr that inhabits it experience an almost continued rocking certain nests present in their structure a perfect masonry made of little sticks gravel or small leaves impregnated with mortar formed of earth softened with the salivary humour of the bird or simply mixed with it how much toil and how frequent must be the goings and comings for the completion of this work and when we remember that the bird has for the execution of its task but a single instrument which also serves for the transportation of the materials we cannot withhold the admiration which is so justly merited the form of these mortar-built nests is ordinarily either spherical conical or elliptical they are established in the angles of windows of chimneys of walls and often on the tables of sheltered rocks they are either isolated or placed one against the other the entrance is made either on the top or in one side and sometimes in the lower part frequently we find in these structures several compartments sometimes a sort of vestibule is separated from the true nest by a partition and it is into this apartment that the male retires after he has carried the necessary food to his sitting female companion there are also birds that build their nest upon the ground and in order to guard against their being submerged by heavy rains elevate them on hillocks of earth these nests are constructed with less care we here find only an abundance of down sustained by flexible twigs suitably interlaced finally some birds are content to form an excavation in the earth or sand in which they deposit their eggs which for the most part they assiduously sit upon but which they sometimes abandon during the day to the heat of the sun nevertheless in this latter case their solicitude induces them to cover their eggs with a light layer of sand or other matter either to hide them from animals that seek them for food or to protect them from the too great intensity of the sun's rays the constancy of birds in sitting on their eggs is admirable sometimes both parents divide this care between them at other times the male only watches the nest and brings food to the female while she remains sitting on the eggs and in other species again the female alone is charged with the incubation generally the mother only leaves her nest for a few moments when pressed by hunger and then seemingly with regret and in most cases after her young have appeared she bestows upon them and for a long time after their birth the most tender care and attention she covers them with her wings to protect them from the cold brings them choice food which she often half digests and then disgorges into their throat to render it better suited to their tender stomach she guides their first steps teaches them to use their wings and when threatened by danger displays as much courage as devotion in their protection in this particular it is very interesting to study the habits of birds but this is not the most remarkable point in their history the most singular phenomenon in the lives of birds is unquestionably the habit which certain species have of making at appointed periods of the year long journeys and changing their climate according to the seasons birds that feed on insects early leave temperate climates to go towards the south where they find in the winter a more abundant supply of food 
other birds change their country to seek a place more propitious for their young and go sometimes to the north and sometimes to the south to lay their eggs in others again this migration is not determined by any appreciable cause some migratory birds perform their journeys through the air alone or only accompanied by their females but the number is small comparatively to those that travel in company we admire in the latter the instinct which induces them to assemble at a certain place ten or twelve days previous to the time of departure which is ordinarily an indication of a change of weather for it is remarked that birds feel the influences sufficiently early to derive prognostics of the change of temperature from their deportment and certain habits during the whole journey the most perfect order prevails throughout the whole troop to be convinced of this fact we have only to observe the flight of some large species such as geese the conducting of the troop is confided to a chief placed at the head of two files more or less separated from each other which meet at a point the chief is the summit or point of this moving angle and opposes the first resistance of the air clears the way and the whole band follows him observing the most perfect order as the efforts of the chief are very violent and as he cannot support them during the whole voyage he is perceived when overcome by fatigue to yield his post to his next neighbour and fall into the ranks at the extremity of one or other of the files the period of these great migrations is fixed by nature for each species of migratory birds and it is remarked they follow the same route every year hence in certain districts the fowlers or bird catchers count upon their passage as upon a revenue of rent that falls due every quarter and calculate in advance the period and the chances armed with their nets and all the apparatus of the chase they station themselves in the gorges and valleys over which the flocks pass and reach their several points a few minutes before their arrival these bands or flocks are sometimes so numerous and the individuals composing them are so close together that they might be readily mistaken for dense clouds certain birds always lead an erratic life and seem to have no country these are the most powerful on the wing many seem not to be impeded by the strongest wind and appear to delight in the midst of storms they form a striking contrast with a small number of species less favoured by nature which deprived of the organs of flight and possessing a slow and embarrassed gait are condemned never to leave the rock on which they were born these birds exercise their patience in awaiting for prey that is brought to them by the rolling in of the waves and it is only when it escapes them and they become hard pressed that they venture into shallow depths in pursuit of it birds also differ very much from each other in their diet or food some seek living prey only and feed exclusively on the produce of their hunting or fishing sometimes they catch other birds of prey and force them to disgorge the food which they were about to eat there are others which with appetites not less carnious but wanting in the strong arms and courage of the first only prey upon dead bodies others live exclusively on worms or insects and others again eat nothing but grains of the classification of birds birds differ much less from each other than the different mammals except some modification in the plumage in the general form of the body in the disposition of the beak and in the conformation of the feet they resemble each other very much hence it is very difficult to subdivide the class which they form the number of species of birds known by naturalists is about five thousand their classification like that of mammals is founded chiefly upon the modifications that are remarked in the organs of mastication and prehension or of locomotion that is the beak and feet according to these characters they are divided into six orders namely rapaches or birds of prey passerinae or migratory birds scansoriae or climbing birds gallinaceae gralatoriae or waders and palmipedes 
or swimming birds. End of lesson two. Lesson three of the Elements of Ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Ornithology by William Ruschenberger. Lesson three: Birds of Prey. Order of Rapaces, or Accipitares. Zoological characteristics, habits. Division into two families. Family of Diurnae, zoological characteristics and habits of vultures, yellow vultures, king of the vultures, condor, Persictopterus of Egypt, griffins, tribe of falcons, division into two groups, noble and ignoble, falconry, common falcon, eagles, fisher eagles, sparrowhawks, kites, buzzards, harriers, characters and habits. Family of Nocturnae, characters and habits, owls, strikes, Duke. Order of Rapaces, or Accipitares, Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey are recognized by their beak, being hooked and terminated by a point which is sharp and bent downwards, and by their feet, being very strong and armed with powerful hooked nails. They are generally remarkable for their strength. The muscles of their thighs and legs are very voluminous, and give great power to their talons. Their tarsi are rarely elongated. All of them have four toes, the first of which, or thumb, is directed backwards. The nails of this toe, and of the internal toe, are the strongest, and there is often a very small palmate membrane betwixt the bases of the external toes. Their wings are large, and the interim, which affords place for the attachment of the principal muscles of flight, is generally very much developed and without lateral notches. It is also to be remarked that their nares are pierced through a membrane, called cera, which covers the whole base of the beak. All the rapaces live exclusively on flesh. They pursue other birds and even small quadrupeds and reptiles. They are also very powerful in flight. Like the passerinae and scansoriae, birds of prey are born generally naked, with the eyes closed, and cannot live without the assistance of their parents, who, during their tender age, supply all their wants. These birds form two families, the diurnae and the nocturnae, which may be distinguished by means of the following characters. Rapaces Diurnae, eyes directed from the side, the head and neck well proportioned, the external toe directed forward, and almost always united to the middle toe by a small membrane. Rapaces nocturnae, eyes directed forward, head very large and neck very short, external toe may be directed either forwards or backwards. Family of day birds of prey, or diurnae. The diurnae have their eyes directed sideways, the head and neck are well proportioned, the nares are pierced through a naked membrane, called cera, which covers the base of the beak. They have three toes in front, and one behind without feathers. And the two external ones are almost always united at their base by a short membrane. Flight powerful, the quill strong, the plumage close, the sternums large and completely ossified, and the fourchette semicircular, and widely separated. Finally, the stomach is almost entirely membranous, and the intestines of a small extent. The family of diurnae is divided into three principal tribes, easily recognized by the following characters. Diurnal rapaces, having eyes even with the head, and talons proportionally feeble, a more or less considerable part of the head and neck destitute of feathers, vultures. Eyes even with the head, and talons proportionally feeble, head covered with feathers, griffins. Diurnal rapaces, having eyes surrounded by a projecting eyebrow, which makes them appear sunk in the head, talons very strong, Falcons. Tribes of Vultures. The vultures, vulture, are recognized by the nakedness of a portion of the head or even of the neck, and by the form of their beak which is elongated and curved only at the end. These birds have a disagreeable aspect, a tainted odor, and their habits excite disgust. They are cowardly, and feed on the most putrid carrion rather than on living prey. The power of their talons does not correspond to their size, and they make use of their beak rather than of their claws. They are extremely voracious, but after they have been completely satiated, it seems, they can wait several weeks for an opportunity of feeding again. After they have eaten, their crop forms a large projection above the fourchette. They become dull and stupid, and a sanguineous fetid humor flows from the nose. The sense of smell in these animals is very fine, and enables them to perceive at incredible distances the remains of dead bodies which they seek for food. In Peru, Egypt, and some countries of the East, they are very useful to man, 
for they serve to cleanse the streets of animal remains that it is customary to throw there, and they may even be seen promenading many towns, in small bands, and watching even in the houses for recent or putrid dead bodies. Vultures live, generally, in pairs. They prefer building their nests on inaccessible rocks, and construct them of pieces of wood, joined together by a sort of mortar. The young are covered with down when born, and are fed on half-digested food, which is disgorged by their parents before them. Their wings are so long that when they walk, they keep them half-extended, and they often experience difficulty in taking to flight after alighting on the ground. Their ascent is slow but well sustained, and is always effected obliquely and by constantly turning about. The tribe of vultures is divided into four genera, namely, the vultures properly so called, the Saccharomphus, the Cathartes, and the Percnopterus, which are distinguished in the following manner. Vultures, having the neck, divested of feathers, as well as the head, the nares, transverse, and the head, without carmicles, vulture, properly so called. Vulture having the neck divested of feathers as well as the head, the nares transverse, and the head with carnacles, Saccharomphus. Vultures having the neck divested of feathers as well as the head, the nares longitudinal, Cathartes. Vultures having the neck almost entirely feathered, Percnopterus. Vultures properly so called are distinguished by their naked head and neck, by the rough or collar of feathers that surrounds the base of the neck, by their stout strong beak, and by the disposition of their nares. They have no fleshy excrescences on the head, and they belong exclusively to the old continent. The most widely diffused species is the yellow or fulvus vulture, Vultor fulvus, which equals and even surpasses the swan in size. It is found on all the mountains of the eastern continent. The Saccharomphus differs from the vulture properly so called in the fleshy caruncles which grow above the base of the beak. It inhabits the western continent. The genus consists of two species. The king of the vulture, Vultur papa, is a species of Saccharomphus of the size of the goose, which inhabits the warm parts of South America. It derives its name from the fear with which it inspires other species of vulture of the same country, the Percnopterus arubu, which abandons its prey and always gives place to him. To this group also belongs the condor, or great vulture of the Andes, Vultur griffis, so famous, through exaggerated accounts, for its size and strength. It is not much more than four feet long, but its spread wings often measure more than ten feet. It flies higher in the air than any other bird. It inhabits the most elevated of the cordilleras of the Andes, and never descends to the plain except when pressed by hunger. Condors are frequently seen on the shores of Chile and Peru, feeding on the carcasses of whales that have been accidentally thrown upon the beach, or left by whalemen. Just before turning off from the beach, we came to the recent carcass of a mule, upon which seven large condors and a crowd of buzzards were feeding. They allowed us to approach so near that, had we been provided with arms, we might have shot them as they allure solely on the wing. These birds frequently destroy small animals. They sometimes form a circle around a sheep, or a goat, and, spreading out their wings, approach till they strike their prey, and then, falling upon it, devour the body, even to the bones. In the country they are caught by the following manner. A pen is formed of high palisades driven into the ground, and a fresh carcass is placed in the center. It is left alone. In a short time the condors, who sent their food for many miles, descend into it, and, while feasting, the peonies, laboring men in Chile are so called, armed with clubs, and the body and limbs well protected with hide, enter the enclosure and commence the work of destruction. These birds cannot rise without running thirty or forty yards, which the limits of the pen will not allow, and they are clubbed to death, not, however, without making resistance, and occasionally inflicting very severe wounds on their pursuers. Three Years in the Pacific The Cathartes, which have no caruncles on the head, and whose nares are longitudinal and oval, are also found in America. There is one species, Carthartes vultorinus, also called Vultor californius, which approaches the condor in size, and has wings even longer in proportion. The tarsi are partially covered by the feathers of the legs. It inhabits California. The turkey buzzard, or Garlinaza, Vultor aura, Cartartes aura, is of a bluish-black color, and as large as a cock. It is common in warm parts of the United States, and is occasionally seen as far north as New Jersey. It feeds upon carrion and filth, but never attacks living animals, except when helpless and unable to defend themselves. This bird is very common in Peruvian towns where it acts the part of scavenger, and is for this reason protected by law. The Percnoptery, which are distinguished from all the preceding by their feathered neck and long slender beak, are of moderate size, and do not possess nearly so much strength as the other vultures, but they attack with greater avidity carrion and all sorts of filth which attract them from a distance, and they do not disdain excrement itself. The Percnopterus of Egypt, Pharaoh's bird, Vultor Percnopterus, or Vultor Leucocephalus, or Vultor Fuscus, 
is of the size of a crow. It is very common in the warm countries of the eastern continent, and it follows the caravans through the desert to devour all that die. The ancient Egyptians respected it on account of the services it rendered the country by removing dead bodies. It is often seen represented on their monuments. Even at the present day no injury is offered to it, and there are even devout Mussulmans who bequeath wherewith to support a certain number. In America there is another species of Pecnopterus, the Urubu, Vulturus Jolta, which performs the same services there. Tribe of Griffins These birds, Gepetos, have the head and neck almost entirely covered with feathers. The beak is strong, straight, hooked at the end, and inflated on the curve. The nostrils are covered by stiff bristles. There is a pencil of bristles under the beak. The tarsi are short and feathered to the toes. In their conformation and habits, they very closely resemble the vultures. Their talons are proportionally weak, and their wings are long and partially separate when in repose. When the crop is full, it projects at the lower part of the neck. The lamb vulture, Vulture barbarus, Falco barbatus, the Lemayer gyre, which the Greeks named Fene, and the Latins called Ossifraga, is the largest of the birds of prey of the eastern continent, the high mountain chains of which it inhabits. It is almost as large as the condor, and attacks lambs, goats, chamois, and, it is said, even sleeping men. Generally it endeavors to force animals to throw themselves from precipitous rocks, and devours them after they have been killed by the fall. His mantle is black, with a white line in the middle of each feather, and all beneath the body, as well as the neck, is of a clear, brilliant yellow color. Tribe of Falcons The diurnal rapaces composing this tribe have the head and neck covered with feathers, like the preceding, but are distinguished from them by their projecting eyebrows, which make the eyes appear as if they were sunk into the head, and give to the physiognomy of these animals an aspect altogether different from that of the vultures and griffins. These birds have a lofty, rapid, and sustained flight. Their sense of sight, which is more extended and clearer than in any other animal, enables them to perceive the smallest prey when they themselves are so high as to be out of the reach of our vision. Most of them feed willingly on flesh while it is yet palpitating, but when pressed by hunger they do not refuse dead bodies, as has been generally believed, and instead of eating their prey on the spot as the vultures do, they bear it off to their eyrie. The larger species attack mammals and birds, others live on fishes, some feed on reptiles, and others are exclusively insectivorous. The female is generally a third larger than the male, and for this reason is often designated under the name of tarsel. Molting takes place but once a year, and age induces such great changes in the plumage of these birds that naturalists have frequently mistaken varieties depending on this cause alone for distinct species. The young are generally variegated with spots and longitudinal stripes, while the old ones are more uniform in color, and are rather striped transversely. They are not clothed in their last or permanent livery until their third, fourth, or even sixth year, and then the colors of their plumage differ according to the sex. They all seize their prey with their talons. Some, such as the falcon, the kite, etc., precipitate themselves perpendicularly upon the animals they wish to possess. Others, the buzzard and goshawks, for example, approach obliquely and attack sideways only. They are, generally, silent and very difficult to tame, though some of them can be trained to hunt on the wing. This tribe, which embraces a great number of species, is divided into two principal sections, namely, noble birds of prey, and ignoble birds of prey, so named because the former are employed in falconry, and the latter are not, and each one of these sections is subdivided in its turn, as may be seen in the following table. Diurnal birds of prey of the tribe of falcons, having the wings pointed, noble birds of prey. The superior mandible armed with a notching near its point, falcons properly so called. The upper mandible having only a scallop near the point, carol falcons. Diurnal birds of prey of the tribe of falcons having the wings truncate at the ends, ignoble birds of prey. Beak very strong, straight at the base and curved only towards the point, eagles. Beak curved from the base, strong, wings moderate, gossuk. Beak curved from the base, feeble, wings long, tail forked, kites. Beak curved from the base, feeble, wings long, tail equal, feathers between the eye and beak, honey buzzards. Tail equal, a naked space between the eye and beak, buzzards and harriers. In the division of noble birds of prey, the second quill of the wing is the longest, and only exceeds the first one a very little, which makes their wings pointed, and influences their manner of flight very much. When the air is calm, their flight is always very oblique, and to rise perpendicularly they have to fly against the wind. Falcons properly so called, falco, are recognized by the tooth or notching with which the upper mandible is armed on each side, near its point, and by their wings being almost always as long or longer than their tail. In proportion to their size they are always the most courageous of all birds of prey, 
a quality which corresponds with the power of their arms and the strength of their wings. They are also the most docile of the hunting birds, and the most important in the art of falconry, as they are taught to pursue the game and return when they are called. The principal species of this genus are the common falcon, falcon communis, which is the size of a hen and inhabits all the northern part of the globe, the hobby, falco subuteo, the merlin, falco escalion, and the falco lithofulco, which inhabit Europe, and when young resemble the common falcon, the kestrels having shorter toes and their flight is not so rapid. The duration of the life of the falcon is very great. It is stated that in the year 1793, a person caught, at the Cape of Good Hope, a falcon wearing a collar of gold upon which was engraved, this bird, in 1610, belonged to James I, King of England. It was consequently upwards of 180 years old, and still preserved its vigor. The flight of the falcon is very rapid. It commonly feeds on large birds, such as pheasants, pigeons, ducks, geese, etc., and to possess them, it rises above its prey and pounces perpendicularly upon it. This quality, and the facility with which the common falcon may be trained, caused it to be much esteemed when the great and wealthy were pleased to pursue game with birds, as they do now with dogs. This bird has given its name to the art of hunting with birds of prey. The manner of training these animals was by shutting them up from the light, exhausting their strength by fatigue and fasting, and then presenting bait, and accustoming them by degrees to pursue this or that kind of game. The gar falcons, here all falco, have the tail much longer than the wings, which are also large. Only one species is known. The gar falcon, or Iceland falcon, falco condicans, and falco islandicus, is most esteemed of all birds in falconry. It is a fourth larger than the falcon, and chiefly inhabits the northern parts of Europe. In the division of ignoble birds of prey, the beak has no lateral tooth near its point, but a simple scallop or festoon, and the fourth quill of the wing is almost always the longest, while the first is very short. In consequence of this, the wings are truncate at the extremity, and their flight is more feeble. They have been called ignoble because they could never be employed in falconry. This section is very numerous, and is divided, as we have already seen, into many genera, which are subdivided again into subgenera, many of which are sufficiently important to be noticed in this place. The genus of eagles, Aquila, comprises the strongest and most courageous birds of prey in the great tribe of falcons, and is distinguished by the form of the beak. It is subdivided into eagles properly so called, fisher eagles, ospreys, harpies, etc. Eagles properly so called, Aquila, have the tarsi feathered to the roots of the toes, and the wings as long as the tail. Their vision is wonderfully extensive, and they are enabled to fix their eyes upon the sun by the aid of a membrana nictus, which lessens the intensity of the light. These birds are remarkable for the nobleness of their bearing, and for their bold and daring attitude. They are celebrated for their courage, and as their habits are always in correspondence with their organization, nature has endowed them with great strength and powerful arms. They are fond of carnage, and in general they prefer attacking animals of a considerable size. It is only when they are pressed by hunger that they pursue small birds, and they never eat carrion, even when in a state of absolute want. They generally live in pairs, but do not permit other birds of prey to reside in the vicinity of their abode. They do not even permit their young to share the domain wherein they are established, and drive them off as soon as they are able to provide for themselves. The male and female are generally seen at short distance from each other, and they seem to have a sort of understanding with each other in hunting. It is asserted that one of the two beats the bushes while the other awaits on some rock or neighboring tree to seize the startled game in its flight. While the female is detained in the eyrie by incubation of her eggs, or by the cares required by her young, the male hunts alone, and, as it is the season when game begins to abound, he easily provides for his own sustenance as well as that of his companion. These animals can endure very long fasting, particularly when captivity or maternal care has forced them to repose. A common eagle taken in a snare has been known to pass five weeks without taking any ailment, and not appear enfeebled, except during the last eight days. The capacity of their crop is very considerable, and this pouch may serve as a reservoir of food sufficient for several days. Eagles properly so called are found in all parts of the eastern continent, and some species belong to New Holland. In general, they inhabit the mainland, and do not establish themselves either on narrow peninsulas or on islands, unless they are of great extent. They live on mountains, and ordinarily construct their nests or eyries on the highest and most precipitous rocks, or in the platform of some deserted tower. These nests are of considerable extent, and rest most frequently on some flat surface found amongst the rocks. They are built of pieces of wood, which are often five or six feet in length. Their interior is lined with moss and dry leaves, and their height increases every year by the accumulation of the bones of animals which these birds bring to their nests. In short, eagles never change their eyrie. The one they built for their first laying of eggs serves them for the remainder of their lives. In the genus of eagles, as well as in all other birds of prey, 
The female is much larger than the male, and seems to also be the most courageous. She lays but two or three eggs each year, and frequently rears only a single eagle at a time. The duration of incubation, at least for the imperial eagle, is thirty days. The common eagle, Falco fucus, Falco melanitos, Falco niger, which is also called yellow eagle or black eagle, and which has been distinguished by the name of royal eagle, from which it differs only in age, inhabits all the great forests of Europe, and is most particularly met with in the mountains of Sweden, Scotland, and the Tyrol. It feeds upon lambs and fawns, which it carries off with surprising force, and rarely attacks large birds. Its eggs are of a dirty white color, spotted red. The imperial eagle, Falco imperialis, Aquila heliaca, has a shorter body, and longer wings than the common eagle. It inhabits the high wooded mountains of the south and east of Europe, and is quite common in Egypt. It pursues deers, roebucks, and other quadrupeds, from which it tears enormous shreds and carries it to the Erie. It is still more terrible to other birds, and to it are attributed most of the exaggerated accounts of the strength, courage, and magnanimity which the ancients gave of the golden eagle. The fisher eagles, Haliatus, differ from eagles properly so called in the Tarsi, only the upper half of which are invested with feathers. They keep near the margins of rivers in the sea, and live chiefly on fishes. The species which are designated by the names of Ossifragus and Pagargus are found in all the northern parts of the globe. The bald eagle, Falcolucocephalus, inhabits North America, and is constantly occupied in fishing. It is of a uniform deep brown color, with a white head and tail, its beak is yellow, and it is almost as large as the common eagle of Europe. It is the figure of this bird that is represented in the national emblems of the United States. The ospreys, Pandian, have the beak and feet of the fisher eagles. Only one species is known, which is found along the shores of fresh waters in almost every part of the globe. It is the fish hawk or osprey, Thalcohaliatus. The great harpy of America, Thalcoharpia. Of all the birds, this possesses the most terrible beak and claws. It is superior in size to the common eagle. Such are its powers that it is said to have cleft a man's skull with its beak. Its ordinary food is the sloth, and it often carries off fawns. The genus of gossocks, Ostor, comprises the gossocks properly so called, and the sparrowhawks. They have the tarsi scutelliated, that is, armed in front with large scaly plates, and are distinguished from each other by the length of this part of the claw. Though cowardly, they may be employed in falconry. The sparrowhawk, Nisus, have the tarsi higher than the gossocks, but the transition from one division to the other is almost insensible. The kites, milvus, have a forked tail and excessively long wings, which makes their flight exceedingly rapid. Their tarsi are short and their nails weak. Their beak is disproportional to their size, and they are the most cowardly birds in this whole tribe. The common kite of France, Falco milvus, of all birds, sustains itself the longest and most tranquilly. The elegance of its flight has been celebrated by poets. It seldom attacks anything but reptiles. The buzzard, ruteo, have very long wings, but their tail is equal. Their feet are strong, and their beak is curved from its base. The only species found in France is the common buzzard, Falco buteo. This bird dwells throughout the year in the forest, and appears stupid and idle. It often remains for several hours together perched upon the same tree. It does not seize its prey upon the wing, but awaits on a hillock of earth, a bush or tree, from which it pounces upon its victim. It feeds on young hares, partridges, young birds, and, when this game fails, even on toads, serpents, grasshoppers, etc., the nest of the buzzard is built of small branches and lined inside with wool or other soft substances. These birds lay two or three eggs, which are whitish, spotted yellow. The mother takes care of the young for a longer time than any other bird of prey, and it is stated that the male continues to feed them after the female has been killed. The harriers, circus, differ from the buzzards in their more elevated tarsi, and by a sort of collar formed on either side of the neck by the ends of the feathers that cover their ears. There are three species in France namely the Falco pagagaris, or bird of St. Martin, which builds everywhere, and keeps very much in the field, the Falco cinerocerus, which has the same habits, and the Falco aeruginosus, which keeps within the reach of watercourses and feeds on reptiles. The honey buzzards, Pernus, are distinguished from the rest of the tribe of falcons by the feathers which cover the space between the eye and beak, which space in all other birds of this tribe is ordinarily naked, and simply furnished with a few hairs. The common honey buzzard, Falco aprovaris, feeds on insects, and principally on bees and wasps. Many naturalists also place in the tribe of falcons the messenger, or secretary, Serpentarius, or Gripogenaris, a bird which inhabits the south of Africa, and which is very remarkable for the extraordinary length of its tarsi, but it differs too much from other birds of prey to be arranged in the same tribe as the preceding, and should constitute by itself a fourth division of the family of Diurnae. The secretary, Falco Serpentarius, 
inhabits the dry and open grounds of the vicinity of the Cape of Good Hope, where it hunts reptiles on foot. Its claws consequently become much worn. I perceived one day, says Monsieur Smith, a secretary that made two or three turns on the wing, near to where I was. He soon settled, and I saw that he examined very attentively some object near the place where he alighted. Having cautiously approached, he extended one wing which he constantly agitated. I then discovered a serpent of large size, elevating its head, and seemingly awaiting the advance of the bird to strike him. But a quick blow of the wing of the secretary soon turned it over. The bird appeared to wait till the serpent should rise in order to strike again, but approached, and seizing it in his claws and beak, rose perpendicularly into the air, from whence he let it fall, and thus finished the killing, and afterwards disposed of it in perfect security. FAMILY OF NOCTURNAL BIRDS OF PREY the birds of prey of the family of nocturnae have a very large head and very short neck. The eyes are directed forward and surrounded by a circle of fringed feathers, the anterior of which cover the serrae of the beak, and the posterior the opening of the ear. The pupil is very large and the sight is weak. The external toe can be directed forward or backward at will. The apparatus of flight is not strong, the fourchette is weak, and the feathers are armed with soft beard and are covered with very fine down. The gizzard is somewhat muscular. These birds, which are often designated under the collective name of owls, strix, are blinded by broad day, and only see well in the twilight, or at night when it is not very dark, the time they choose for hunting. And, as their silky feathers permit them to fly without noise, it is very easy for them to obtain possession of birds and small mammals upon which they suddenly pounce. There are some species that hunt even in the daytime, but during this period they generally retire into hollow trees or rents in walls. Sometimes they lay squat on branches of trees, and then all the little birds, of which they are the terror during twilight, come to tease and insult them. During the night they often utter plaintive cries, which the vulgar regard as unfortunate omens, but in reality these birds are more useful than injurious to agriculture, on account of the number of small mammals of the order of rodentia which they destroy. It is probable the large size of the head, and their habitual tranquility, obtain for them the reputation for wisdom which they enjoyed among the animals. All the nocturnal birds of prey resemble each other very much, and the differences observed pass from one to the other by such insensible intermediate shades it is difficult to establish good generic differences in this family. Owls properly so called, eared owls, otis, have the disc of fringed feathers which surrounds the eyes very complete, and itself bordered by a circle of scaly feathers. They have movable tufts half the length of the head, the external ear very large and furnished in front with a membranous operculum, and the feet are feathered to the nails. The common owl, Strix otis, is frequent in France and the United States. Its length from the top of its head to the end of its tail is thirteen or fourteen inches, and its plumage is yellow with brown spots. It ordinarily inhabits forests, and establishes its retreat in caverns, deserted houses, in ruins, and during the whole night utters sad and plaintive groans. It often takes possessions of nests, abandoned by crows, ducks, etc. The howlers, Ulula only differ from the preceding owls in the absence of the tufts of feathers, which in common language are sometimes called horns. The screech owls, strix, resemble owls properly so called in the disposition of their ears, but are distinguished from them by the beak, which is elongated and curved only at the extremity, while in the other nocturnae it is arched from the base. They are without tufts, and instead of feathers have only hairs on the toes. The common species in France, known as the screech owl, affray, is of all the owls most especially regarded by the people as a bird of ill omen. Its plumage is yellow, shaded with ash color or brown above, and prettily spotted black and white. It is found in Asia and America as well as in Europe. The hooting owls, Ceronium, differ from the screech owls in their auditory conch which is reduced to an oval cavity that does not occupy the half of the height of the cranium. Their feet are feathered down to the nails. The dukes, or horned owls, Bulbo, have tufts like the eared owls, and an auditory conch as small as the hooting owls, but they have the disc of feathers around the eyes less marked than the preceding owls. The Grand Duke, or Great Horned Owl of Naturalists, Strix Bubo, is about two feet long, and is the largest of all the nocturnae. It is common in the great forests of the eastern parts of Europe, and is also met with in France. Its food consists ordinarily of moles and small animals of the order Rodentia, but we are assured that it sometimes attacks young roebucks, and it often contends with buzzards and carries off their prey. The great horned owl of the United States, Bulbo virginius, which is found in all parts of our country, feeds on the Godonilus birds, domestic poultry, hares, opossums, etc. In former times, this owl was employed in falconry to attract the kite. They tied a fox's tail to the duke to render its figure still more extraordinary. It flew even with the ground and alighted in the fields without perching on trees. The kite, which perceived it from a distance, came and approached the duke, or great horned owl, not to attack, 
but rather to examine it, and kept near it long enough to be taken by the hunters or by the birds of prey which they let slip in pursuit. The owls of the genera Noctura and Scora have the opening of the ear larger than ordinary birds, and the disc of feathers around the eyes smaller and less complete than in all the preceding owls. These characters coincide with the peculiarities of their habits, which bring them near to the diurnal birds of prey. In fact, many owls see sufficiently well in the day to distinguish and pursue their prey. The scopes have the head furnished with tufts. There is one species found in France, whose plumage is ash color, spotted black. End of Lesson 3. Recording by Todd. Lesson 4 of The Elements of Ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenberger. Lesson 4 Order of Passerinae. Zoological Characters. Habits. Division into Five Families. Family of Dentirostres, Shrikes, Flycatchers, Coatingas, Blackbirds, Thrushes, Water Thrushes, Orioles, Lyres, Warblers, such as the Nightingales, Linnets, and Wrens. Family of Fissirostres, Swallows, Habits, Swallow, properly so called, Martin, Goat Suckers, Habits. Family of Conirostres, Larks, titmouse, buntings, sparrows, crows, crow properly so called, jackdaw, magpie, jay, birds of paradise. Order of Passerinae. This order includes all birds that are neither swimmers, waders, climbers, rapacious, nor gallinaceous. That is, it contains all birds that are not assigned to the other five orders. We find its characteristics, therefore, are purely negative. Yet, although we cannot unite all the species that belong to it under a common description, they nevertheless naturally resemble each other in the totality or assemblage of their organization. The Passerinae have neither the violence of the birds of prey, nor the fixed regimen of the gallinaceous or aquatic birds. Insects, fruits and grains constitute their food, which consists more exclusively of grain, in proportion to the largeness of their beak, and more exclusively of insects, as it is more slender, and those that have strong beaks pursue even small birds. The proportional length of their wings and the extent of their flight are as variable as their habits. They have four toes, three before and one behind, and occasionally two before and one behind, and sometimes all four are in front but there are never two before and two behind, as in the next order, and the middle toe is joined to a greater or less extent to the external toe by means of a membrane. The order of Passerinae is very numerous, and is divided into five families, namely Dentirostres, Fissirostres, Conirostres, Ternurirostres, and Syndactylae. Family of Dentirostres this family includes those passerinae only that have the beak notched on both sides near the point. They are all insectivorous, and most of them also eat berries and other tender fruits. They have been classed according to the general form of their beak, and in this way divided into many tribes, the chief of which are shrikes, flycatchers, coatingas, tanagers, ant-catchers, thrushes, etc., orioles, warblers, and cocks of the rock, etc. The shrikes, Lanius, have a moderate but strong beak, which is straight from its origin and very compressed. The upper mandible is strongly curved towards the point where it forms a hook and is armed with a deep notch. Its base is provided with stiff hairs and is destitute of sear. Though small in size, these birds are full of courage they contend with birds of prey, and, like them, live by rapine. They feed on insects and small birds, and always inhabit the woods and bushes on the plains. 
they live in families and fly irregularly and precipitately uttering shrill cries there are five species in europe and several in america the common or great shrike lanius excubitor which is ash-coloured above white beneath and of the size of a thrush and the butcher bird lanius colorio which is smaller than the others has the back and wings fawn colour this last bird destroys a great many small animals birds and young toads as well as a number of insects grasshoppers beetles etc which it has the habit of sticking on the thorns of bushes in order to devour them at leisure or to find them again when wanted this little shrike makes its appearance in the spring and quits france and the united states in the autumn the cassicans and vangas and several other genera are grouped in this tribe and have similar habits the flycatchers mushy capper are found in all parts of the world their beak is moderate strong and compressed towards the point which is curved and deeply notched the base is furnished with long stiff hairs that cover the nostrils which are lateral and oval these birds are travellers they feed on small birds or on insects which they catch on the wing they alight on trees in the forests europe possesses a great many species the name of tyrant tyrannus is given to those flycatchers of america that have a strong beak other birds of this division on the contrary have a very slender beak they defend their young even from the eagle and drive all birds of prey from their nest the larger species feed on small birds and do not always despise carrion the cotingas or crown birds and palis are for the most part remarkable for the beauty of their plumage their beak is short slightly depressed a little convex above and suddenly flexed at the point their nostrils are half closed by a membrane and covered in a degree by the hairs of the face their feet are moderate all the species belong to south america the plumage of the male is in general adorned with the richest tints of purple and azure but these birds are not in all their beauty except in the spring for during the rest of the year their tints are grey or brown the chatterers bombichilla have the head ornamented with a toupee of feathers there is one species the bohemian chatterer ampalis garrulus that visits europe in flocks at long and irregular intervals from which circumstance its presence for a long time was considered as an evil omen it is thought to inhabit the extreme north the flesh is esteemed a great delicacy the cedar bird or cherry bird bombichilla carolinensis is found throughout the american continent some of them remain in pennsylvania and new jersey during the winter the tanagers tanagra are small birds remarkable for the most part for the varied colour of their plumage they resemble the finches in their habits and feed on grain as well as on berries and insects the summer red bird tanagra estiva is of a vermilion red it passes the greater part of the year in the tropical america it is met with in the sandy barren forests of new jersey in small numbers the thrushes turdus have a moderate beak with a sharp compressed point but not forming a hook and having the notches not so deep as in the shrikes they are more frugivorous it is to be remarked also that their nostrils are half closed by a naked membrane and the tarsi are longer than the middle toe some remain in the country where they are born others travel in numerous flocks the flesh of most of these birds is much esteemed we apply the name of thrushes properly so called to those species in which the colours are uniform or distributed in large masses and we call those thrushes in which the plumage is dappled that is marked with small black and brown spots the european blackbird turdus merula is found in france throughout the year the male is entirely black with a yellow beak and the female is brownish these birds are the first to hail with their songs the return of spring heard at a distance they are very agreeable 
they possess the power of passing from the lowest to the highest tones in captivity their voice loses its brilliancy and becomes even hoarse and false this blackbird loves solitude it only keeps in the thickest and most distant copses it feeds on worms and insects and very adroitly breaks snail shells against rocks or stones the female constructs her nest with great art which is well cushioned on the inside and covered on the outside with grass she ordinarily lays four or five blue eggs covered with brown spots the griever or common thrush turdus musicus somewhat smaller than the preceding is brown on the back reddish yellow with black spots on the neck and breast white on the belly and flanks with black spots the wings are brown above yellow beneath the beak is brown and the tarsi are brownish gray it is met with in france only as a bird of passage it arrives there in great flocks at the end of september and sojourns nearly a month then it returns in march and april to disappear again in may a few individuals however remain and build on low trees or bushes they lay two or three times a year from four to six eggs each time the song of the thrush is agreeable and its flesh is delicate it announces the return of spring and remains during three quarters of the year it is often heard when the skies are heavy with clouds which circumstance has gained for it in some countries the title of bird of storms when this thrush is disturbed his hoarse and noisy song seems to be a mixture of warbling and cries in its ordinary condition its gamut is on the contrary a scale of soft and grave tones it often sings many hours together without the slightest interruption when reared with the linnet and nightingale it seems to study their song and ends by appropriating it the american robin or migrating thrush turdus migratorius is found in summer throughout the north american continent the robin redbreast which is said to have covered with a leafy shroud the lost and wandering babes in the wood is held in universal respect its song however has not the compass and variety of the preceding species the missile thrush turdus vichivorus the letorna turdus pilaris and the mavis turdus eliacus are three other species of thrush which are also found in europe the mockingbird turdus polyglottus an american bird celebrated for the astonishing facility with which it unhesitatingly imitates all the sounds it hears also belongs to the tribe of thrushes the water thrushes chinklus have a cutting straight elevated beak compressed and rounded towards the end with the point of the upper mandible bent over the lower one there is but one species in europe which has the singular habit of descending into the water without swimming but walking about the bottom in search of small animals upon which it feeds the american water ousel or dipper chinclus americanus is cinereus gray with a blackish brown head and neck it is distinguished from the european species by the absence of the white on the chin and throat of the particular habits of this bird little is yet known the ant catchers myothera so called because they live chiefly on ants are recognized by their long legs and short tail they are found on both continents the orioles aureolus resemble the thrushes very much but their beak is a little stronger their legs are shorter and their wings a little longer in proportion the european oriole or golden thrush the yellow thrush of the germans aureolus galbula is of nearly the same size as the thrush nine or ten inches long and the spread of the wings about sixteen the male is of a beautiful yellow the wings the tail and a spot between the eye and beak are black and the end of the tail is yellow but during the first two years of life like the female at all times he has an olive in place of the yellow and brown in place of the black colour this bird suspends its nest which is very artfully constructed from the branches of trees in the summer it eats cherries and other fruits but in the spring it feeds on insects it remains in europe only during the warm season and goes to africa to pass the winter it migrates in companies of five or six 
in the summer when it has become fat its flesh is good to eat and were it not so difficult to rear it would be the ornament of our cages for its beauty the baltimore oriole or golden robin aureolus baltimore icterus baltimore comes amongst us from its winter retreats in south america about the first week in may it bears a general resemblance to the preceding the lyres maera have been placed with the gallinaceous birds by some naturalists who were more struck with their large size and the disposition of their feet and other characters but in reality these birds approach much nearer to the thrushes from which they scarcely differ in the form of their beak they are distinguished by the singular conformation of the tail of the male bird the different feathers of which exactly resemble a lyre these birds belong to new holland only one species is known the warblers morticilla are extremely numerous in species which are found in all countries they have a straight slender beak in the form of a bodkin higher than it is broad at the base the point of the upper mandible is often notched and the lower one is straight the nostrils are half closed by a membrane the tarsi are longer than the middle toe birds of this genus are emphatically singers they are almost all migratory and insectivorous they are divided into many subgenera among which we may mention the trachees saxicola are lively birds that stand tolerably high on their legs the french species build on the ground and feed exclusively on insects such are the common trachea morticilla rubicola and the wheat ear morticilla aianta the rubiettes sylvia live on insects worms and berries they are solitary and generally build in holes the stone chat morticilla rubicola belongs to this subgenus in the division of fauvettes curuca the beak is more slender than in the trachets or rubiettes the most interesting species of this little group is the nightingale morticilla luscinia the plumage of which is reddish brown above and whitish grey beneath the tail being a little red this bird whose song is so celebrated never lives in flocks the female constructs her nest in the foliage of straw and moss she ordinarily lays two or three times a year and four or five eggs on each occasion while she is sitting the male perched upon a neighbouring branch endeavours to relieve the weariness of her task by the harmony of his voice if an enemy approach he continues to sing and his interrupted accents tell his companion all she has to fear in the silence of the night when all other birds have suspended their concerts the melodious voice of the nightingale alone is heard and the variety the sweetness and harmony of his notes place him in the first rank of singing birds the fauvette morticilla orphea which is ashy brown above whitish beneath is common in europe and particularly in the southern provinces of france which it leaves in flocks about the middle of autumn to return in the spring it feeds on insects and soft fruits and makes its nest in the bushes or reeds the male has a strong sonorous voice which is not disagreeable its song says buffon somewhat resembles that of the nightingale and is enjoyed for a long time for many weeks after the songster of the springtime is hushed the woods everywhere resound with the song of the fauvette its voice is smooth pure and light and its succession of modulations though of small extent are agreeable flexible and graduated the wrens regulus are little birds that keep on trees and there pursue gnats the reutlet or kinglet morticilla regulus is the smallest of european birds the head of the male is adorned with a small yellow tuft bordered with black these birds possess a great deal of activity and agility they are almost always in motion they leap from branch to branch climb trees on all sides they eagerly hunt in all the cracks of the bark and sometimes they suspend themselves feet upwards like the tomtit they feed on insects little worms and various small grains the female lays from ten to eighteen eggs 
which scarcely exceed a large pea in size her nest of leaves is placed on the branches of the fir tree in such a manner as to be swayed in all directions by the wind the true wrens troglodytes have the middle toe rather long and the nails of moderate length they are remarkable for their almost domestic habits often building from preference about houses either empty or inhabited they also sing agreeably species are found on both continents the house wren troglodytes aden sylvia domestica is only a summer resident of the united states but the winter wren troglodytes hyamalis sometimes passes the winter in pennsylvania the wagtails morticilla are remarkable for the length of their tail which they are constantly elevating and depressing the meadow larks or titlarks antus somewhat resemble the larks alauda on account of the long nail with which their thumb is armed the common titlark antus pretensis or alauda pretensis frequents humid prairies and becomes extremely fat in the autumn in many parts of france it is then sought and is known under the name of beckfig beckafica the cocks of the rock rupicola are distinguished from all the preceding species of the family of dentirostres by having the two external toes united for about one-third of their length from the base the two american species when full-grown are of a beautiful orange colour and have a double vertical crest on the head formed of feathers arranged like a fan they are found in the warm parts of south america family of fissirostres the fissirostres are distinguished by their beak which is short wide horizontally flattened slightly hooked without a notch and very deeply cleft that is the commissure or line of junction between the two mandibles is extended so that the opening of the mouth is very wide and they easily swallow the insects they pursue on the wing all these birds are exclusively insectivorous they are also migratory and migrate in the temperate zones their flight is the most extended of all terrestrial birds they are found in all parts of the world this family is divided into two tribes namely first the diurnal fissirostres with a dense plumage and a beak that opens to beneath the eyes second the nocturnal fissirostres the plumage of which is soft and light like that of the owls and their beak opens to a point beyond the eyes the diurnal fissirostres constitute the genus of swallows hirundo all of which are remarkable for the length of their wings this genus is subdivided into swallows properly so called and swifts the latter have a remarkable conformation of the claws the thumb is directed forward almost like the other toes which are all separate and each one has but three phalanges while in the swallows properly so called the thumb is inserted behind the tarsus and preserves the same direction as in the other passerine the external toe is united to the median as far as the first articulation and the number of phalanges is not unusual swallows properly so called hirundo have a triangular beak broad and depressed at the base a little curved at the point the nostrils oblong the legs short the wings very long and the tail ordinarily forked these birds delight most in those places where flies and other winged insects are common they construct their nests with great care often of a sort of masonry in the ground the female sometimes lays twice a year most of the swallows leave us towards the end of september and migrate in large flocks to warm countries where they pass the winter but return in the beginning of the spring and take possession of the nest they had left the preceding year their habits are mild and they are remarkable for their sociability they often join a great number together to drive off an enemy the attack of which any one of them may fear the swallow announces even to swifts and other small birds the approach of a bird of prey at the sight of an owl or a hawk it utters a piercing cry immediately all the birds of its species and the swifts assemble around it and often march in line against the enemy 
which they harass until he is forced to beat a retreat in the genus of swallows we must mention the martin hirundo urbica which is black above white below and on the tail and the feet are feathered to the nails it arrives about the middle of april and disappears about the middle of september it constructs its nest of earth lined inside with straw and feathers which it often places in the angles of windows and beneath the eaves the chimney swallow hirundo rustica is an inch longer than the preceding with a very forked tail and naked toes it is black above the front that is the forehead throat and brows are red and the rest of the bird is ordinarily white it arrives a little earlier than the preceding constructs a similar nest which it commonly places on chimneys in stables and barns the salon game or edible swallow hirundo esculenta which inhabits the east indian archipelago is celebrated on account of its nest which it constructs of a whitish gelatinous substance arranged in layers this substance is a marine plant which it soaks in the sea and grinds previously to using these nests are eaten dressed like mushrooms and in soup the chinese regard them not only as an excellent dish but also as a very restorative and medicinal kind of nourishment a very extensive commerce is carried on in this article which has been sold as high as five dollars a pound from thirty to fifty thousand pounds are used in china every year the swifts caetura or martins or martinets cypsalus have a forked tail which consists of six quills only while in the swallows properly so called there are twelve their legs are very short and their toes are directed forwards these birds scarcely walk at all and are seen constantly in the air pursuing in flocks and with loud cries insects in the upper regions of the atmosphere they nestle in holes in walls and in rocks and climb along smooth surfaces with great rapidity the common martin hirundo apus is about eight inches long and the spread of the wings is nearly fifteen inches it is black with a white throat it appears in france in the month of april and departs on the approach of cold it ordinarily lays from two to five eggs once a year the tribe of nocturnal physiostres is composed of the genus of goat suckers the goat suckers caprimulgus all resemble each other in their plumage and habits they only appear towards evening and for this reason they might be called crepuscular birds the silky nature of their feathers and their mixed and delicate colours give them as far as relates to their external covering a strong resemblance to owls their eyes are large their beak which is furnished with strong moustaches and more deeply cleft or open than in swallows is capable of receiving the largest insects which it retains by means of a viscid saliva the nostrils which are in the form of small tubes are near its base their wings are long their feet short and the tarsi feathered the thumb can be directed forward these birds live isolated and only fly during the twilight or in fine nights they pursue the phalaenae and other nocturnal insects and lay a small number of eggs on the ground without taking much care to construct a nest when they fly the rushing of the air into their wide mouth produces a peculiar humming noise it has been said that they suck the goats but this is untrue the notion arose probably from their frequenting the fields where goats and sheep were herded in pursuit of the insects which are attracted there in great numbers only one species of goat sucker is known in europe the european goat sucker caprimulgus europaeus is of a brown grey undulated with blackish brown with a whitish band running from the beak to the back of the neck it arrives in france in the spring nestles in the heath and the moment its food begins to grow scarce it seeks a warmer climate there is one species in africa remarkable for a feather twice the length of the body which arises from near the carpus of each wing and is barbed only near the extremity the warm parts of america abound in these birds the chuckwell's widow caprimulgus carolinensis 
appears in the southern parts of the United States about the middle of March. The head and back are dark brown, minutely mottled with yellowish red, and longitudinally streaked with black. The whippoorwill, Caprimulgus orchiferus, is heard during the spring and early autumn in the middle section of the United States. Its general colour is a brownish grey, streaked and finely sprinkled with brownish black. About the middle of May, the female lays two eggs. Like all birds of this genus, she builds no nest, but deposits her eggs upon the bare ground, in some dry and sequestered situation. The nighthawk, or nightjar, Caprimulgus americanus, is met with in all parts of the United States. It is of a brownish black, mottled with white, and a pale reddish brown above, and a greyish white, undulated with dark brown below. Nighthawks arrive in the middle states towards the close of April. They are commonly seen towards evening in pairs, sailing around in sweeping circles, high in the air, occasionally descending lower to capture flying insects, chiefly of the larger kind, such as wasps, beetles and moths. About the middle of August, they begin their migrations towards the south, and may be seen as late as the middle of September, in the evening, in scattered flocks, consisting of several hundreds together, moving towards more congenial climes, darting after insects, or feeding leisurely as they advance. Sometimes different species of swallow are mingled in these wandering tribes. Family of Conirostries All the birds of this family have a strong beak, more or less conical, and without a notch. They live on grains, more exclusively in proportion to the strength and thickness of their beak. The principal genera of this family are the larks, the titmice, the buntings, the sparrows, the crossbills, the crows, and birds of paradise. The larks, a lorder, have a straight, short beak in the form of an extended cone. Their head is small, round, and furnished with feathers on top, which are more or less erectile. Their tail is of moderate length, and almost always forked. Their nostrils are covered by small feathers which are directed forwards. The posterior nail is straight, strong, and much longer than that of any of the other toes. The conformation of their nails does not permit these birds generally to alight on trees, but it is useful to them when they run over newly ploughed ground. They dwell, in general, on the ground, and feed on grains, tender herbs, insects and larvae. They also have the habit of dusting themselves by fluttering on the ground. The common lark is found nearly throughout the eastern continent. During the summer, these birds prefer dry, elevated situations, and delight in soaring to great heights in the air, singing in a strong, melodious voice. In winter, they assemble in large numbers on the level country in search of food. When the cold is intense, they take refuge among the rocks, and along streams that do not freeze, and when pushed by want, they approach our habitations. They nestle on the ground, and, without becoming familiar with man, they become accustomed to captivity. Their flesh is esteemed a delicacy. The shore lark, Alorda alpestris, is of a reddish grey inclining to brown above, whitish beneath, with the throat and a stripe over the eye of a pale yellow, the tail and wings, and a patch on the breast, black. This beautiful species is common in the northern parts of both continents. These birds arrive in the northern and middle states early in October, and generally disappear on the approach of snow. The skylark, Alorda arvensis, is universally known by its perpendicular mode of soaring, accompanied by its varied and powerful song. It is brown above, whitish underneath, and spotted throughout with a deeper shade of brown. The tits, or titmice, parus, have a slender and very short beak. They are extremely lively little birds. They are constantly leaping from branch to branch in short flights, climbing and suspending themselves in all manner of positions, plucking the grains upon which they feed, also eating many insects, not even sparing small birds when they find them enfeebled by sickness or entangled in snares. 
they are often seen to pierce their skulls by repeated strokes of the beak to devour the brains they also pick the bones to a skeleton in proportion to their size which is very small these are the strongest of all birds they attack owls fiercely they have the habit of storing a provision of grains they nest in the hollows of old trees and lay more eggs than any other of the passerine birds species are found in all parts of the world and there are several in the united states the tufted titmouse parus beacola is crested and scarcely exists north of pennsylvania and new york it is of a dark bluish ash colour above whitish beneath and the flanks are tinged of a yellowish brown the buntings Amberiza, have a short straight conical beak the upper mandible being narrower enters within the lower and there is a projecting hard tubercle on the palate all these birds are granivorous yet they also eat insects they inhabit thickets fields covered with hedges gardens and the woods rarely they have little foresight and are readily caught in traps some of them assemble in numerous troops in the winter the most common species in france are the yellow bunting Amberiza chitrinella the common bunting Amberiza miliaria and the ortolan Amberiza ortolana and there are several in the united states amongst the latter may be mentioned here perhaps the rice bird or bobolink Amberiza orisivora or dolichornix orisivorus the sparrows have a conical beak which is more or less thick at the base they generally live on grains and are for the most part voracious and destructive they are divided into sparrows properly so called weavers linnets goldfinches etc to the genus of sparrows properly so called pergita belong the common sparrow fringilla domestica which is brown spotted blackish above with a whitish band on the wing gray beneath the sides of the crown in the male reddish and his throat black it abounds in all parts of the eastern continent except in those places where wheat does not grow this bird nests in holes in walls and is very destructive from its voracity the farmers complain very much of the pillage of these birds the destructive war they wage against caterpillars and winged insects compensates however for their passing devastations and everything considered it may be said they are more beneficial than injurious to rural economy the sparrow is courageous and often contends with birds ten times larger than itself and sometimes enters dovecots these birds ordinarily nest under eaves or in hollows of trees the nest is constructed of hay and straw lined with feathers it is placed so as not to be injured either by the sunshine or rain the tenderness of the female for her young is very interesting the male is distinguished from the female by a black spot on the beak the common chaffinches fringilla calebs are among the most common of european birds their habits are nearly the same as those of the common sparrow but they are more lively and their song is more varied the common goldfinch fringilla cardoalis is among the most beautiful birds of europe it is very docile and quickly learns to sing and to play all kinds of tricks the yellow bird or american goldfinch fringilla tristis has black wings varied with white and a black tail tipped with white in summer the male is dressed in yellow with a black crown and in the autumn in brown olive which is the permanent colour of the female and young yellow birds it is a general inhabitant of the united states the common snowbird fringilla hyamalis is a hardy and very numerous species common to both continents about the middle of october they pour in flocks from the northern regions into the united states where their arrival is looked upon as the presage of winter the linnet fringilla cannabina is found in all parts of europe and chiefly inhabits the plains its song is very agreeable the canary bird fringilla canaria somewhat resembles the linnet though it differs from it very much in colour it sings so agreeably and is so easily multiplied in the state of captivity that it has become common throughout the world 
most naturalists agree that it came originally from the canary islands where it is found wild in great numbers but some travellers suppose that it was first brought from asia the grosbeaks cacathorstes are distinguished from other sparrows by the great size of their beak which is exactly conical the common grosbeak loxia cacathorstes is the most strongly characterized it inhabits woody mountains and eats almonds and all sorts of fruit the bullfinches pirula have a round beak which is inflated in every direction and sufficiently strong to crush the hardest seeds the crossbills loxia resemble the bullfinches but the mandibles of the beak are so much curved at the point that they cross each other by this singular beak they are enabled to tear out the seeds from under the pine cones the common crossbill curvirostra americana is found inhabiting the extensive pine forest in the interior of pennsylvania and the northern states from april to september the beef eaters bufaga make use of their beak which is inflated at the end to compress the skin of cattle to squeeze out the larvae of the aestrus which they eat only one species is known which inhabits africa the starlings sternus have a straight beak depressed at the point they also follow cattle and feed on insects they are found in all parts of the world the crows corvus have a large beak straight at the base curved towards the point and cutting on the edges their nostrils are concealed by hairs directed forwards their toes are entirely divided and their wings are truncate at the extremity they live in troops and are cunning and distrustful they readily become familiar and learn to speak with considerable facility the senses of this bird that of smell particularly are very acute they have the habit of stealing and concealing everything they find even articles which are useless to them such as small pieces of money they provide provision for the future season and feed on every kind of aliment grains fruits insects and worms living or dead flesh so that no animal better merits the epithet of omnivorous the principal species of this genus are the raven corvus corax is the largest passerine bird found in europe its size is almost equal to that of the domestic cock its plumage is entirely black its tail rounded the back or top of the upper mandible arcuate in front the female is of a less decided black and her size is somewhat less this bird flies well and high it perceives dead bodies at a great distance and feeds besides on all kinds of fruits and small animals it lives very retired but in pairs which make their nest in crevices of rocks or in holes in walls in old abandoned towers and sometimes upon the summit of lone trees the nest is very large and is composed externally of branches and roots of shrubs bones of quadrupeds or fragments of hard substances form the second layer and the interior is lined with herbs moss and hair about the month of march the female lays five or six eggs of a pale bluish green colour marked with a great many obscure spots and tints the cares of incubation which last about twenty days are shared by the male the raven is met with in all climates it appears to be insensible to the vicissitudes of the seasons when other birds are overcome by the cold and oppressed by hunger it leisurely seeks its prey and hunts in the coldest atmosphere some travellers assert that they have seen ravens that were entirely white which is apparently attributable to the rigorous climate of northern regions the crow corvus americanus like the raven is a denizen of nearly the whole world our native crow is black and glossy with violet coloured reflections it is a troublesomely abundant resident in most of the settled districts of north america it is easily raised and domesticated and soon learns to distinguish the different members of the family with which it is associated the fish crow corvus ossifragus keeps apart from the common species and spends its time near rivers hovering over the stream to catch up dead and perhaps living fishes it breeds in new jersey in tall trees 
having nests and eggs very similar to the preceding species. The jackdaw, Corvus monadula, is about the size of a pigeon. It is less black than the crow, inclining even to ash colour about the neck and below. It inhabits Europe throughout the year, and keeps about the tops of churches, in old towers, in ruined buildings, and sometimes, though rarely, around chimneys. Its nests are also found in the hollows of trees and rabbit burrows. The female lays five or six eggs, which are paler and smaller than those of the raven. Jackdaws are readily tamed and may be taught even to pronounce words. They like to hide a part of their food, and we sometimes find in their holes small pieces of money which they delight in stealing. They feed on grains, insects and fruits. They are particularly fond of partridge eggs, and they have been known to catch fish. The magpie, picker, corvus picker, is a beautiful bird, of a silky black colour, with purple, blue and gold reflections. It is white beneath, and there is a spot of the same colour on the wing. The magpie is omnivorous, and often commits great ravages in granaries and poultry yards. It never attempts long journeys, but flies from tree to tree when at a short distance apart. The female takes great pains in the construction of her nest, never leaving a greater opening than is necessary for her own entrance and egress. She covers it with a transparent veil composed of small thorny branches closely interlaced. She lines it with wool and other soft materials upon which her young ones snugly repose. She lays seven or eight eggs of a pale grey colour, spotted black. This bird may be easily tamed and taught to pronounce words, and even short sentences. Often, when a strange sound strikes her ear, she endeavours to imitate it. Like other birds of its genus, it is inclined to theft, and also has the habit of concealing superfluous food. The magpies are known to make so great a destruction among the eggs of grouse, pheasants, partridges, and even among young chickens, in many parts of Europe, as to be prescribed by law, and destroyed for the premium justly set on their heads. In this country, these birds are confined to the northern regions, and to the plains and tablelands of the Rocky Mountains west of the Mississippi. In Upper California, there is a species which differs from the preceding, in having the bill, and a bare space beneath and behind the eye, yellow. It is called the yellow-billed magpie, Pica nutalii. The jay of Europe, Corvus glandarius, is of a vinous grey, with moustaches, and the quills of the tail black. It is particularly remarkable for a spot of dazzling blue, striped with a deep blue, which marks a part of the wing coverts. Jays are met with that have a white or yellowish plumage, and a red iris, like that of albinos. This bird is spread almost throughout Europe, where it lives in pairs, which assemble in small troops, and feed on acorns, gooseberries, cherries, and insects. The jays are of a petulant nature. They are very lively, and quick in their motions, and in their frequent paroxysms of rage, they forget their own self-preservation, and are sometimes caught by the head betwixt two branches, and die, thus suspended in the air. Their perpetual agitation leads to increased violence when confined, and for this reason they are not recognisable in a cage, not being able to preserve the beauty of their feathers, which are soon broken, torn and disordered by their continual rubbing against its walls. The elegant and common American species, the blue jay, Corvus cristatus, resembles the preceding in its temper and habits. It is crested, it is blue above, and beneath whitish with a black collar. The wing coverts are transversely barred black, and the tail is wedge-shaped. The great crow blackbird, Quiscalus major, is glossy black. This large crow-like species, sometimes called the jackdaw, inhabits the southern maritime parts of the United States. It is sociable in disposition, and often mingles with the common crow blackbirds. It is omnivorous, and feeds on insects, small shellfish, corn and small grain, so that by turns it may be viewed as the friend or plunderer of the planter. The common crow blackbird, Quiscalus versicola, 
and the rusty blackbird quiscalus ferrugineus are two other american species of this genus birds of paradise paradisia like the crows have a straight quadrangular pointed beak which is compressed and a little convex above their nostrils are covered by the velvety feathers of the front these birds which are indigenous to new guinea and the neighboring islands are all provided with the most brilliant plumage their history was for a long time a tissue of fable and absurdity the female it was asserted laid her eggs while flying and had no legs and when sleeping it suspended itself from branches of trees by the long thread-like feathers of the tail that it fed exclusively on dew and never touched the earth till it was dead all these accounts have found their place and observation has revealed the truth the most celebrated species is the emerald bird of paradise paradisia apoda its head is small but ornamented with feathers that in brilliancy rival those of the peacock the neck is of a yellowish tint the body is very small but covered with long feathers of a brown tint sprinkled with gold two long bearded filaments or thread-like feathers spring from the rump and form the tail the long light and graceful feathers of this bird form the most beautiful and most sought plumes for the decoration of ladies headdresses these birds travel in troops of thirty or forty under the direction of a chief which the indians call the king their light plumage does not permit them to fly against the wind and if overtaken by a gale they rise into the upper regions of the atmosphere and leave the storm below them End of Lesson 4Lesson number five of the Elements of Ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert J. Eckrich. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenberger. Lesson number five. The family of Tenurostris, the family of Syndactyle, the order of Scansoriae. Family of Tenurostras. Birds of this family have a slender, elongated beak without a notch, and which is sometimes straight and sometimes accurate. The principal genera of this family are the nuthatches, creepers, hummingbirds, and hoopoes, which may be recognized by the following characters. The nuthatches, sitta, have a moderate, straight, depressed beak, which is cylindrical, conical, and trenchant at the point. Their nostrils are partly covered by hairs directed forwards, and their tongue is short and very slightly protractile. They climb with agility in all directions, live on insects, and nestle in the trunks of trees. The common European nuthatch, Sitta europera, is of a bluish ash color. It is sedentary and inhabits the lofty forests. The male joins the female in the spring in constructing the nest. They establish themselves in a hole in a tree, and if the hole is too large, they reduce it with mud, which circumstances acquired for it the name of mason pie. They line the interior with a thin bed of moss, upon which the female lays from five to seven grayish eggs, marked with small red spots. It is said she is so much attached to her eggs that she never leaves them during the whole period of incubation, and takes no other food than that brought to her by the male. The young escape from the shell about the month of May, and very soon retire to live by themselves. These birds feed on insects, grains, hazelnuts, beech nuts, flax seed, etc. The mode of getting out the substance of the hazelnuts consists in fixing them solidly in a crack and then piercing them by repeated blows with their beak. In the United States, we have the white-breasted nuthatch, Sitta carolinensis, which is lead color, with the head and neck black above and pure white beneath. The red-bellied nuthatch, Sitta canadensis, which is of a rust color beneath and some others all of which in their general habits resemble the european species the creepers certhia have a beak of moderate length more or less accurate triangular compressed and slender 
their nostrils, which are horizontally pierced, are half closed by an arched membrane. Creepers properly so called, Certhia, have a slanting tail, which is furnished with stiff, sharp quills. It serves to aid them in climbing trees. Their tongue is sharp and adapted for piercing insects upon which they feed. There is one species found in Europe and one in the United States. The European creeper, Certhia familiaris, is a small bird which is met with in different parts of Europe, as far north as Siberia. It is constantly climbing trees in pursuit of insects and larvae. The brown creeper, Certhia americana, is of a dark gray varied with white, brown, and dusty, white beneath, the rump and tail rusty. This industrious forager for insects, chiefly dwelling in the seclusion of the forest, is but seldom seen in summer. But on the approach of winter, with other hungry wanderers of similar habits, such as the small woodpeckers and nuthatches, he makes his appearance on the wooded skirts of the village, particularly among pine trees, and occasionally becomes familiar enough to pay a passing visit to the orchard. The species is neither common nor abundant, though their breeding range extends from Pennsylvania to Newfoundland. There are several subdivisions of this genus. Those known in France under the name Echelettes tychodroma climb like the preceding, but without supporting themselves with their tail, which is feeble and rounded. They keep more on walls and rocks than on trees. The hummingbirds, Trochylus, are celebrated for the beautiful colors and metallic luster of their plumage, as well as for their small size. They inhabit America and the adjacent islands. Their beak is long, straight or accurate, tubular and very slender. Their tongue is long, extensible and bifid, that is, divided into two filaments. Their nostrils are covered by a wide arched membrane, and their feet, which are very short, have the tarsi shorter than the middle toe. Their wings are very long. Their plumage is sometimes ornamented with patches that are as brilliant as precious stones. They feed on the nectar of flowers, about which they are seen buzzing and balancing in the air like certain flies, or rather butterflies. They sometimes eat small flies and other diminutive insects which they find in flowers. They live isolated and defend their nests courageously, and sometimes contend fiercely with each other. The northern hummingbird, Trochylus culibris, is golden green, the tail forked and dusky, and the three outer tail feathers are of a rusty white at tip. The male has a changeable ruby-colored throat, which in the female is nearly white. This wonderfully diminutive and brilliant bird is the only one of an American genus of more than 100 species, which ventures beyond the limits of tropical climates. Hoopoes, Eupua, have an ornament on the head formed of a double range of long feathers, which they can erect at will. Family of Syndactyle in the birds of this family, the external toe is almost as long as the middle one, to which it is joined by a membrane as far as the penultimate articulation. The principal genera of this family are the bee-eaters, the kingfishers, and the caleos, or hornbills, which may be readily distinguished from each other by the form of the beak. In the bee-eaters, it is of a moderate size and slightly accurate. In the kingfishers, long and straight and in the hornbills of a disproportionate size and surrounded by an enormous protuberance. The bee-eaters, marops, have a moderate-sized beak, which is trenchant, pointed, slightly curved, without a notch or tooth, and with an elevated edge. Their nostrils are partly concealed by hairs directed forwards. The external toe is joined to the middle one as far as the second articulation and the latter is joined to the external as far as the first articulation. The common bee-eater, Merops apister, is the only one found in Europe, has a fawn-colored back, a deep marine blue front and belly, and a yellow throat surrounded by black. It feeds on insects, particularly wasps and bees, which it seizes while on the wing. It constructs its nest in the precipitous banks of streams and large rivers, into which it digs to considerable depths. The kingfishers, Alcedo, have a quadrangular beak, which is long, straight, pointed, and trenchant. Their nostrils are almost entirely closed by a naked membrane. 
Their legs are short and bare to above the knee. The only species found in Europe is Alcedo isipida. It is rather larger than a sparrow and is green, undulated with black above, with a stripe of deep marine blue along the back, reddish beneath, with a ribbon of the same color on each side of the neck. The American species, the belted kingfisher, Alcedo alcyon, is crested and of a bluish slate color. It inhabits all the northern part of the American continent. His delight is to dwell amidst the most sequestered scenes, on the borders of rivers and streams, abounding in small fish and insects upon which he feeds. By the broken or rocky bank of his aquatic retreat, he may be frequently seen perched on some dead and projecting branch, scrutinizing the waters for his expected prey. If unsuccessful, he courses along the stream just above the surface and occasionally hovers for an instant with rapidly moving wings over the spot where he perceives his gliding quarry. In the next instant, descending with a quick spiral sweep, he seizes a fish with which he rises to his post and swallows in an instant. When startled from the perch, on which he spends many vacant hours digesting his prey, he utters commonly a loud, harsh, and grating cry, very similar to the uninterrupted cracklings of a watchman's rattle, and almost, as it were, the vocal counterpart to the watery tumult amidst which he usually resides. The nest is burrowed in some dry bank above the reach of inundation to a depth of five or six feet. The female lays six or seven white eggs and is assisted by the male in the incubation, which continues about sixteen days. The Caleos, or hornbills, Bruceros, are large birds of India and Africa, remarkable for their enormous dentated beak, which is more or less accurate, surmounted by a crest or prominence, often as large as the beak itself. These singular birds hunt mice, reptiles, small birds, and even attack dead bodies. Order of Sanscorii, or Zygodactyli. In birds of this order, the external toe is directed backwards, like the thumb, which arrangement gives them a more solid support, and of which some genera take advantage in clinging to and climbing the trunks of trees. It is from this circumstance they have obtained the common name of climbers, although, strictly speaking, it is not applicable to all of them, as there are many birds that truly climb, which, owing to the disposition of their toes, do not belong to this group. Every bird that has two toes directed forward and two directed backwards belongs to the order of Sanscorii, or climbers. The habits of most of the species that belong to it are not known, and they vary in almost every genus. The climbers generally nest in the hollows of old trees. Their powers of flight are middling. Like the Passerini, they feed on insects, or fruits according, as their beak is more or less strong. It is remarked that in most of the genera that the sternum has two notches behind, which conformation is in accordance with the little strength of the muscles of their wings. The principal genera may be distinguished by the following characters. The woodpeckers, picus, are distinguished by their long, straight black beak, which is adapted for piercing the bark of trees, by their slender tongue, armed near the end with spines curved backwards, which can be extended considerably beyond the beak, and by their tail, which is composed of ten quills with stiff and elastic stalks, which serve them as a support when they climb trees. All these birds are climbers and have a family likeness to each other. They all have the habit of tapping and raising up the bark of trees to seize the insects which it conceals, and, after having struck on one side, of quickly running to the opposite to seize the insects which the noise may have caused to run away. It is erroneously believed that they can, in this way, pierce trees entirely through. Most woodpeckers are marked with red, either on the head or body, almost all of them streaked or speckled with brown on the ground color of their plumage. Their cry is sharp, and their flight heavy. They are lean, little esteemed, and inhabit all parts of the world, both within and without equatorial regions, except New Holland. There are several species of woodpeckers in the United States, the most common of which are the flicker or golden-winged woodpecker, Picus aratus, and the red-headed woodpecker, 
Picus erythrocephalus. Birds resembling woodpeckers are known, which have but three toes, two of which are directed forward and one backwards. The rhinex, yunks, have the protractile tongue of the woodpeckers, but without the spines. Their straight and pointed beak is nearly round, without any well-marked angles, and is not sufficiently strong to penetrate and raise the bark of trees. Like the woodpeckers, they live on insects, but climb much less. The European rhinek, Jungsturkila, is of the size of a lark. It is brown above, streaked in little blackish waves, and longitudinal meshes of fawn color and black. Beneath it is whitish, with transverse blackish stripes. This bird, which is solitary in its habits, loves the mountain woods, and makes its appearance in France in May, and departs again in September. Without making a nest, it lays in the holes of trees soon after its arrival. The Rhinek derives his name from a habit, which is peculiar to it, of twisting and turning the neck to one side and behind while the head is turned toward the back and the eyes half closed. The cuckoos, cuculus, have a moderate beak, well cleft and slightly accurate. The tarsi are short and the tail long, composed of ten quills. They are birds of passage and live on insects. The female makes no nest and takes no care of her young. She deposits her eggs in the nests of other birds, most frequently in that of the favette. The strange nurse to whom the cuckoo confides her eggs becomes not only the best of mothers for the young prodigy that does not belong to her, but to take care of them she neglects her own eggs and only hatches a part of them. It is remarked that the young cuckoos raise up the young ones of the favette and push them out of the nest that they may not share the attentions of their common nurse. These birds remain in the nest more than three weeks after their birth, and for five weeks longer their adopted mother supplies them with food. The American species, on the contrary, are faithfully paired and take care of their young. The yellow-billed cuckoo, or rain crow, Culus americanus, is dark grayish-brown with bronzy reflections and white beneath. The toucans, Ramphastos, are easily recognized by their enormous beak, which is almost as large and as long as the body. Internally it is light and cellular, accurate towards the end, and irregularly dentate on the edge. Their nostrils, which are surrounded by a membrane, are concealed behind the horny mass that sheaths the front. Their tongue is long, narrow, and furnished on each side with barbs, like a feather. These singular animals inhabit only the hottest parts of America. They live in troops and feed on fruits and insects. They seek the nests of other birds and devour their eggs and their recently hatched young. When they obtain their prey, they do not attempt to grind it in their beak, because its structure prevents, but they toss it in the air and, receiving it as it falls, swallow it whole. The parrots, Pisiticus, form a genus, numerous in species, which are found in all warm countries. They have a large, hard, solid beak, which is rounded everywhere, and surrounded at its base by a membrane through which the nostrils are pierced. Their tongue is thick, fleshy, and round. Their feet are short and strong. They feed on fruits and climb trees, assisting themselves with their feet and beak. They readily become familiar, and some species imitate the human voice very well. But their clamorous disposition renders them disagreeable in the house. The plumage of parrots varies in color. It is generally remarkable for its clear and vivid tints. Frequently, green predominates, while in certain species, on the contrary, red is the prevailing color. From their intelligence, these birds seem to claim a place at the head of their class, and form the connecting link between it and the superior beings in the scale of animals. They learn to talk, retain airs, and are, in short, susceptible of education. They convey their food to the beak with their claws. They are frugivorous, and also feed on buds, tender bark, roots, and sweet juices of plants. This genus is divided into macaws, parakeets, parrots properly so called, cockatoos, etc. The macaws, ara, have a wedge-shaped tail, which is longer than the body, a strong beak, 
and a naked face. They are all American. The Ara Acarii, or blue macaw, is the one most frequently seen in France, where it is produced in the domestic state. It is from 30 to 32 inches in length. All the upper parts, that is, the top of the head, the back of the neck, the back, the rump, the wings, and all the top of the tail are of a brilliant azure blue. The chest and all the under part of the body are of a bright yellow. The naked space on the cheeks is of considerable extent and is of a rosy white color with three little horizontal lines of black feathers. The throat is surrounded by a broad greenish collar. The parakeets also have a wedge-shaped tail which is sometimes longer than the body, sometimes of the same length, and sometimes shorter. They have a moderate beak and the face is ordinarily feathered. The Carolina parrot Pacificus carolinensis is green, the head and neck yellow, forehead and cheeks orange, tail elongated. Of the more than 200 known species of this brilliant genus, it is the only one found inhabiting the United States. It is rarely met with north of Virginia. The parrots properly so called have a short, square tail, a stout and strongly hooked beak, the face feathered, a large head, and a stout body. They all inhabit the torrid zone. The gray parrot, or Jocko, Pacificus erythricus, is entirely ash color with a red tail. It is originally from Africa and is much prized on account of its gentleness, its attachment to its master, and the facility with which it learns to speak. The name of Amazonian parrots is given to those that are very large with a stout body and green plumage. The cockatoos have the head ornamented with a tuft of feathers. The plumage of the greater number is white, and of all of the various species, they are the most docile. End of lesson number five. Recording by Robert J. Eckrich, Germantown, Maryland, USA. Lesson six of the elements of ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tex Avi. The Elements of Ornithology by William Ruschenberger. Lesson 6. Order of Gallinaceae. 1. The order of Gallinaceae comprises those terrestrial birds which have a short or moderate beak vaulted above. The nostrils pierce through a membranous space and covered by a cartilaginous scale. The body heavy and the wings in general short. 2. These birds are essentially granivorous and are provided with a very strong muscular gizzard. They delight in seeking their food on the ground amidst dust. Their sternum is weakened by two large notches which occupy its posterior part on each side. Their inferior larynx is very simple, and not one of them sings agreeably. 3. Most of our poultry belongs to this order, and no other affords man so many resources for his wants or his pleasures. The flesh of many of the Gallinaceae supplies a light and wholesome meat, which nourishes without overloading the stomach. Their feathers are applied to different purposes. They are employed as ornaments and also in the useful arts. These birds are almost all from the warm countries of both continents. 4. This order is divided into two families as follows. 5. First, the Gallinaceae, properly so called, having the interior toes united at their base by a short membrane, which is dentate on the edges. The tail is generally composed of 14 or a greater number of quills. 6. Second, the pigeons, having the toes entirely divided and the tail formed of 12 quills. Family of Gallinaceae properly so called. 7. The Gallinaceae properly so called have a short convex beak with the upper mandible arched or vaulted and curved from its base to the point. Their nostrils, which are pierced 
through a broad membranous space are covered by a cartilaginous scale. The three front toes are united by a short membrane. The posterior toe articulates high on the tarsus above the articulations of the anterior toes. Sometimes, though rarely, the posterior toe is entirely wanting, or it is very small, and in many species, principally in the male, we remark on the posterior part of the tarsus above the thumb, a process or projection called a spur, formed by a bony spine covered externally with horn, more or less pointed according to the species and which increases in length as the animal advances in age. The tarsi are short or of moderate length, and the feet are adapted for running or walking. These birds are very heavy, the body is fleshy and the wings short, which, with the weakness of their pectoral muscles, renders their flight laborious. They are all pulverators, that is, they love to scratch the ground and wallow in the dust. They generally feed on grains, sometimes on insects, and many species on berries and buds, or swallow fluids when introduced into the beak. They elevate their head in the air. The females live in troops with a single male. Their nest is almost always made without art upon the ground, and the male takes no part either in its construction or in the incubation of the eggs, the number of which is generally considerable. So soon as the young ones escape from the shell, they walk, eat alone, and abandon the nest to follow their mother. They remain together, forming a family until the following spring when they separate. The sexes differ very much from each other in their plumage, at least until they have attained an advanced age, when the female sometimes appears in the plumage of the male, which is more brilliant. They also differ in size, the female in most species being smallest. 8. The principal genera composing this family may be recognized by the following characters. 9. The Hakos, a lector, are large Gallinaceans, birds of America, analogous to turkeys, with a large round tail, composed of twelve large stiff quills. Their beak is thick, stout, compressed at the sides, surrounded at the base by a naked skin, which is sometimes gibbous. The tarsi are elongate, and without spurs. They have four toes, three before and one behind the latter resting a part of its length on the ground. These peaceful birds are easily tamed and keep in great forests and on mountains. They seek their food on the ground and perch upon the highest trees. Some nest on the large branches of trees and others on the ground. Their nest is composed externally of dried branches and moss and internally of leaves. They lay from two to eight eggs. In some parts of America, huckos are red as poultry. Their head is ornamented with a tuft of elevated feathers, which are curled at the end. 10. Turkeys Meligris have the head and the top of the neck covered by a papillated skin, which is destitute of feathers. Under the throat, there is an appendage which hangs from the neck and on the front another conical appendage which lengthens and swells in the male during excitement a pencil of stiff hairs or bristles hangs from the lower part of the neck of the male the tail coverts which are shorter and stiffer than in the peacock can be erected in the same manner so as to form a circle the males have feeble spurs turkeys of which only two species are known are originally from america whence the missionaries introduced them into Europe. The first turkeys appeared in France in 1570 and were served at the wedding of Charles the Ninth. They have been naturalized in all climates on account of the excellence of their flesh. 11. Peacocks Peacocks have a moderate conical curved beak which is naked at the base. The superior mandible is convex and vaulted. The head, which is covered with feathers, is ornamented with a crest.
the tarsi are armed behind with a conical spur with the most remarkable characteristic of these birds is that the upper tail coverts in the male are longer than the quills and may be elevated when he spreads his tail the common peacock pavo cristatus has the head crowned with a crest of twenty-four straight feathers and the feathers of the rump which have a floating or loose beard are of unequal size being shorter in proportion as they are superior and each one is terminated by numerous brilliant metallic circles the female is destitute of this ornament the richness and the beauty of which known throughout the world are beyond description particularly when the bird spreads its tail the peacock is still widely diffused in the wild state in the north of india and its most parts of the indian archipelago twelve the pintados of guiana fowls numida have a naked head with fleshy wattles on the lower part of the cheeks and the cranium is generally surmounted by a callous crest their feet are without spurs their tail is short and pendant and the feathers of the rump give the body a rounded form thirteen all the pintados are originally from africa they live in numerous troops under bushes and in corpses where they seek berries and small snails on which they feed the european species have been transported to the new world where in many places they have become naturalized in the wild state fourteen pheasants Zanius, are naked around the eyes and cheeks are covered by a red skin or by very short feathers they have no crest and lower mandible is without wattles the tail quills eighteen in number in most of the species are placed on each other in two layers like shingles on the roof of a house or in other words the tail is tactiform and maintained in a horizontal position this genus is divided into many subgenera among which we will cite the cocks and the pheasants properly so called fifteen the cocks or gallus have a beak naked at the base furnished with two pendant and compressed caruncles the head is surmounted by a fleshy crest or a bundle of feathers the tarsi are armed with a long curved spurs and the only the end of the thumb rests on the ground the wings are short the quills of the tail fourteen in number form two vertical planes placed back to back in the male the coverts of the latter are prolonged into an arch over the tail proper sixteen the common cock Zanius gallus the female of which is called a hen is originally from india it is still met with wild in the mountains of india but in the domestic state it is spread throughout the world there exists a great number of varieties of it seventeen the pheasants properly so called have a long cuneiform tail each of the quills of which being inclined on two planes cover each other like the shingles of a roof to this group belongs the common pheasant of europe which is so originally from asia and which is also remarkable for the beauty of its plumage in the male the top of the head and the upper part of the neck are of a silver gray which in the reflections of the light seems to change to blue the feathers of the chest of the shoulders of the middle and the back as well as those of the sides beneath the wings have a blackish ground with the purple edges on transverse lines of gold color the plumage of the female is not so beautiful as that of the male the iris is yellow and the eyes are placed between two parts which are of the scarlet color it is said that the pheasant was originally introduced into europe by the argonauts from the banks of the river phasius in asia minor eighteen the golden pheasant the cyanus pictus comes from china it is one of the most beautiful birds known the belly is of a bright red a tuft of golden yellow reclines from the top of the head the neck is surrounded by a magnificent orange collar sprinkled with black the upper part of the back is green and the lower part as well as the rump is yellow the wings are bright red with a beautiful spot of blue the tail which is a very long is brown spotted with gray nineteen the argus cyanus argus comes from the south of asia 
the head and neck are nearly naked the tarsi are without spurs and secondary feathers of the wings are covered with eye-like spots which when the wings are spread give the bird a remarkable appearance twenty no true pheasant has yet been discovered in america twenty one the goose tetru are recognized by a naked and ordinarily red strip that occupies the place of the eyebrow they are very numerous and are divided into many subgenera the principal of which are the following twenty two first the heath cocks have the tarsi covered with feathers and without the spurs and toes naked and the tail round or forked twenty three second the ptarmigans or white goose which have the toes feathered as well as the legs twenty four the partridges the tarsi of which are naked like the toes and armed only in the male with short spurs or simple tubercles twenty five fourth the quails which also have naked tarsi without spurs and in which the eyebrow is not red twenty six the heath cocks tetro are for the most part birds of large size there is one species in france which is larger than turkey and even larger than any other gallinaceous bird the great heathcock tetra ura gallus the plumage of the male is slate colour finely and transversely striped with black the female which is a third smaller is fawn colour with transverse black or brown lines the young resemble the female up to the first moulting this bird is found in considerable numbers in russia siberia and generally in all the northern parts of europe and asia and is more rare in germany hungary and france it also lives in the same place inhabiting through preference mountain forests and feeds chiefly on berries buds young shoots grains insects and worms its flesh is delicious twenty seven the ruffed goose is mottled the tail is grey or ferruginous speckled or barred with black the male has a ruff of broad black feathers on the sides of the neck in the female the ruff is smaller and dusky brown it is known by the name of the pheasant in the middle and western states and by that of the partridge in new england it inhabits the american continent from hudson's bay to georgia but is most abundant in the northern and middle parts of the united states it feeds chiefly on berries twenty eight the pinnated grouse tetra cupido is partly crested and mottled and the tail is rather short and much rounded the goose or prairie hen is confined to dry barren and bushy tracts of small extent and in several places it is now nearly or wholly exterminated it is still met with on the grus plains of new jersey on the bushy plains of long island in the similar shrubby barrens in connecticut and in the island of martha's vineyard on the south side of massachusetts bay twenty nine the ptarmigans or white goose have a round or square tail and often become white in winter the ptarmigan constantly resides in the coldest arctic deserts and in the lofty mountains of central europe where as the snow begins to melt away it seeks out its frozen bed by ascending the limits of eternal ice it is common to the extreme northern regions of both the old and the new continent it feeds on many kinds of berries heath young shoots of pine and occasionally eats a few insects to protect themselves against the extreme cold of the climate ptarmigans dwell in the snow as soon as they leave their frozen retreats in the morning they fly vigorously upward in the air shaking the snow from their warm and white clothing they are much esteemed as food in every country where they occur and are commonly taken in nets between the months of april and may it is said that as many as ten thousand are taken for the use of the hudson's bay settlement and in europe during the winter they are carried in thousands to the markets of norway thirty partridges live in pairs and keep on the ground 
Two species of partridge are common in France, the grey and the red. The grey partridge, Tetru cinereus, keeps in the fields. It is ashy brown, elegantly mingled with black. The tail is short and the legs are of a greenish white. The beak and feet are ash color. In young partridges, there is observed between eye and ear a naked skin which is of a brilliant scarlet. The male has on the breast a chestnut-colored spot in the form of a horse shoe. The female is distinguished by a less brilliant and less marked colors. She lays from twelve to eighteen eggs and makes a nest on the ground of dry leaves and moss. The young ones run the moment they escape from the shell, a part of which they frequently drag after them. It not unfrequently happens that they place the eggs of a partridge under a hen, who sits upon and takes care of them as they were their own. 31. The Red Partridge Tetra rufus has the beak and feet red. It prefers to keep on hills and elevated places. Its flesh is wider than that of the grey partridge. 32. Ortics have the beak short, thick, higher than it is wide, the upper mandible curved from the base, no naked space around the eye, the nostrils half closed by a membrane, the tarsus is destitute of spur or tubercle. 33. These birds alight on low trees or bushes, sometimes roosting in them. They also dwell on the ground, both by night and day. They are usually monogamous, the male taking charge of and protecting the young, which associate with the old until the time of pairing. These are peculiar to America. 34. The American partridge or quail, Ortex virginiana, is without a crest, the plumage cinnamon brown, varied with black and whitish, throat white, bounded with a black crescent, beak black, the feet ash colored. Though the partridges of America are exceedingly prolific, they have been so thinned in some parts of the country that sportsmen, acquainted with their local attachments, have known to introduce them into places of breeding, to prevent their threatened extermination. 35. The Quails Caturnix are smaller than partridges and have a shorter tail. The common quail of Europe, Tetru Curtinix, has a brown back, waved with black and dotted with white a brown throat, and a whitish eyebrow. The female makes a nest like the partridge. She lays six or seven eggs, which are of a grey colour with brown spots. They are hatched at the end of about three weeks. 36. Quails are birds of passage and celebrated for their migrations. They are found throughout Europe and in most parts of the United States. In the autumn, they pass an immense troops from Europe across the Mediterranean to the coast of Africa. They return in the spring, and at that time they rest on some one of the islands of Archipelago. Family of Pigeons 37. The Pigeons, Columba, are regarded as forming the natural link or transition between the Passerin or Galinaceae. 38. Pigeons have a moderate, compressed, straight, vaulted beak, which is curved at the point. Their nostrils are in the middle of the beak, pierced through a soft skin and covered by a cartilaginous scale, which is inflated or bulged at the base of the beak. Their feet are frequently red. They have three toes in front, which are entirely separate, and a posterior toe, which is articulated upon the same plane as the others. They fly well and differ very much from the common Gallinaceae in their habits. When they drink, they do not elevate the head as the latter do, and they ordinarily perch on trees. These birds always live in a state of monogamy, and the male never leaves his female companion. They evince great mutual tenderness and express it by frequently caressing each other and by the accents of their voice the modulation and tone of which has been designed by the term cooing. Both unite in the construction of the nest and place it according to the species, sometimes on the tops of the highest trees, amongst bushes, or even on the ground, and other times in the cavities of rocks. This nest, coarsely constructed of small branches and leaves, is very open, 
and ordinarily receives only two eggs upon which the male and female alternately sit one of these two eggs usually gives birth to a male and the other to a female and these two individuals being reared together remain forever after paired they feed their young by disgorging into their little throats grains macerated in their own stomach and which they cause to regurgitate into the beak by a kind of contraction 39 these birds form but a single genus among the wild species in europe are the cushat the rock dove and the turtle dove 40 pigeons are reared in vast numbers in the domestic state one of the most celebrated race is the carrier pigeon which is distinguished from all others by a broad naked band which surrounds the eye and its deep black plumage it is remarkable for its la rapid flight and for the singular faculty it possesses of again finding the place where it was born or where it left its young after having been carried to the very great distances it has been often employed to convey letters and has been known to make a journey of upwards of a hundred leagues in a few hours 41 among the american species the most remarkable is the passenger pigeon columba migratoria which is a bluish gray with a white belly and black tail the wild pigeon of america it is estimated can fly several hundred miles at a rate of a mile a minute the whole species seems to be always congregated in one huge flock composed of millions of individuals and they remain in one locality for several years and then leave it from dearth of food which appears to be the one sole cause that determines their migrations they feed on acorns and berries end of lesson six recording by tech savvy www.techsavvy.wordpress.com Lesson 7 of The Elements of Ornithology This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Cayo. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenburger. Lesson 7. Order of Grallatoriae. Zoological Characters, Habits, Division into Eight Families. Family of Peripines, Ostrich, Organization, Habits, Cassowaries. Family of Preserostres, Bustards, Plovers, Lapwings. Family of culture ostries, cranes, common crane, herons, common heron, storks, common stork, spoonbills. Family of longer ostries, genus of curlews, ibis, sacred ibis, snipe, woodcock, common snipe, the eversets. Family of macrodactyly, rails, water hens. Family of flamingos, common flamingo. Habits. Order of Grallatoriae. The order of Grallatoriae is composed of birds that have the lower part of the leg naked like the tarsus. Almost all these birds are remarkable for the length of their legs and appear as if they are mounted on stilts. Their feet, most generally, have a small palmate membrane betwixt the external toes and they sometimes are without a thumb. Their form is ordinarily lank, and their neck is very long. Their beak varies in its shape, but is also in general very long. Most of the Grallatoriae, which are also called waders, are beach birds, frequent watery places, and wade in shallow waters to seek their food. With some exceptions, they all feed on animal substances and seek fishes, reptiles, or worms and insects, according as their beak is strong or weak. A small number of them feed on grains and herbage, and these only live remote from water. And almost all these birds have very long wings. They fly well, and extend their legs behind them when they fly, whereas other birds, on the contrary, fold them under the belly. 
the grallatoriae which build their nests on trees and in elevated situations are monogamous and feed their young until they are able to fly almost all of those that build on the ground are polygamous and their young seek their own food soon after birth this order is composed of five principal families and three small isolated groups which differ too much from the other grallatoriae to be comprised in the preceding divisions and may therefore be considered as forming so many separate families the five principal families which are characterized according to the form of the beak are the peripenes the preserostries the culturostries the longerostries and the macrodactyli the three accessory families each one of which is formed of a single genus are the sheath bills or vaginals the glarioles and flamingos family of peripenes the peripenes are very large birds that are entirely incapable of flying and have rudimentary wings only but they are remarkable for the strength of their posterior extremities which renders them excellent runners here the muscles of the chest not being required as in the case in other birds to make the strong efforts necessary to depress the wings during flight are very small and there is no projecting keel in the middle of the sternum for their attachment as in other birds this bone is in the form of a simple shield it is to be observed also that all the peripenes want the thumb and that both in the form of their beak and in their regimen they are very analogous to the gallinaceae this family is composed of two genera the ostriches and the cassowaries the first have broad flexible feathers and the second are covered with narrow stiff plumes almost like bristles ostriches struthio are very large birds with long legs and tarsi a long slender neck and a very small head they have only rudimentary wings composed of loose flexible feathers with isolated barbs which are entirely unsuitable for flight but which these animals make use of in running the beak which is of moderate length is soft at the end the eye is large and the lids are fringed with eyelashes the tongue is short and rounded like a crescent the crop is enormous the gizzard very strong and the intestines voluminous and above the cloaca there is a sort of large reservoir in which the urine accumulates as in a bladder this is the only bird that urinates two species of ostriches are known one proper to the eastern continent and characterized by having only two toes the other proper to america which is recognizable by having three toes the ostrich of the eastern continent struthio camellus is the largest of birds it attains six or seven feet in height and weighs as much as eighty pounds the head and neck are thinly covered with feathers the back breast and belly are covered with black mingled with white and grey feathers and those of the wings and tail are white the thighs are almost as naked as the neck and of the two toes which terminate the foot the external one is but half the length of the other and without a nail this bird lives in numerous troops on the sandy deserts of africa and arabia it is essentially herbivorous but it is so voracious that it indiscriminately devours everything that falls within its reach until its stomach is filled it even swallows stones fragments of metal pieces of wood and animal as well as the vegetable substances upon which it feeds the strength of its stomach is enormous it can run more rapidly than the fleetest horse the strength of this animal is astonishing 
an ostrich with two men on its back has been known to run faster than an excellent english courser the eggs of the ostrich weigh nearly three pounds each in those countries which are not very warm the female and even the male sits upon them but on the burning deserts near the equator they leave them in the sand exposed to the heat of the sun the period of incubation seems to be about six weeks and the young are feathered when born and able to run at once the broad flexible feathers of the wings and tail of the african ostrich are much prized as ornaments the american or three-toed ostrich Shuthiorea, is more than one half smaller than that of the eastern continent its plumage is greyish and the feathers are scarcely of any value it abounds in buenos aires the cassowaries Casuarius are recognized at first sight by the feathers the barbs of which being so lightly fringed that at a distance they resemble pendant hairs their wings are even shorter than those of the ostrich and are totally useless even in running these species are known namely the emu or crested cassowary and the cassowary of new holland the emu or crested cassowary struthio casuarius is almost as large as the ostrich of the eastern continent but not so tall it is remarkable on account of the azure blue and red skin that covers the head and part of the neck for its pendant caruncles like those of a turkey and for a sort of helmet or crest formed by a bony prominence covered with horn which surmounts the head the feathers of the body are black and for the most part double it runs almost as rapidly as the ostrich it inhabits the indian archipelago the cassowary of new holland cassowarius novae hollandiae is of a brownish grey and almost the whole head as well as the neck is covered with fringed feathers its speed is greater than that of the preceding species its flesh resembles beef family of preserostres the preserostres like the peripenes and many of the longerostres are high on their legs and without a thumb or the thumb is too short to touch the ground their beak is of moderate length and sufficiently strong to dig the earth in search for worms their wings are sometimes short but can always be used in flight the family is composed of bustards the plovers and lapwings and some other genera the bustards otis are large heavy birds that resemble gallinaceae in the massive form of their bodies and in having the upper mandible slightly vaulted their wings are short and they fly but little most commonly like the ostriches they employ them only to accelerate their speed when running their food consists of grains herbs worms and insects two species are found in europe namely the great bustard and the little bustard the great bustard otis tada which is of a bright fawn colour crossed with numerous black streaks on the back and greyish on the rest of the body attains to more than three feet in length the male is the largest of european birds the female is about one-third smaller it is a timid bird and keeps on naked and extended plains it flies little but runs with great rapidity it nests in fields of grain and often unites in bands of from fifty to sixty individuals the little bustard otis tetrax is more than one half smaller than the preceding it is brown dotted with black above and whitish beneath it is less frequently met with than the great bustard the plovers caratrius like the preceding have no thumb 
but their moderate beak is compressed and swelled at the end their wings are moderate and they fly well they habitually frequent sea coasts the mouth of rivers maritime marshes and feed chiefly on worms which they induce to crawl out of the ground by striking their feet upon it some species live solitary and others in small troops they emigrate every year in more or less numerous troops and it is chiefly in the autumn during the rains that they are seen in greatest numbers from this circumstance they have obtained their name when on land they are in constant motion and they fly in a long file their flesh is delicate and esteemed in those provinces where they are common many are taken by means of nets the species of friends are seen only in autumn and spring they are the dotteril the golden plover and the ring clover they are all found in the united states there are several species which have a horny spur on the carpal end of the forearm the lap wings venellus differ from plovers in having a thumb but it is so small that it does not touch the ground their habits are the same and they often go in company with them the crested lap wing venellus cristatus inhabits europe it is a pretty bird of the size of a pigeon bronze black with a long and slender crest it arrives in france in the spring builds its nest in the fields and remains through the summer but most of the species very soon after their arrival continue their course to the north and return in the autumn the oyster catchers hematopus have a somewhat longer beak than the plovers and lapwings they dwell exclusively along the borders of the sea frequenting beaches and sandy shores where they are seen to follow the waves in search of marine insects the oyster catcher hematopus australigus is common to the north of both continents and is frequent on the seashores of new jersey and the southern states family of culturostres all the grallatoriae of this family have a long thick strong beak which is frequently transient and pointed in general they have a well-marked thumb it may be divided into three tribes namely first the cranes which have a straight beak slightly cleft and nearly one half of it is occupied by the membranous fossae of the nostrils second the herons whose beak is strong cleft to beneath the eyes and grooved third the storks whose beak is very long and very strong the cranes grooves have a straight beak which is but slightly cleft the toes are moderate the external ones being a little palmate and the thumb scarcely touches the ground almost all of them have the head and neck to a greater or less extent destitute of feathers their habits are more terrestrial than those of the other culturostres and their food is more vegetable the trumpeteers sophia and cranes properly so called are ranged under this division among the former are the crowned crane which comes from the western coast of africa and the numidian crane and amongst the latter is the common crane which is more than four feet high and which is celebrated for the migrations it makes every autumn from north to south and every spring in a contrary direction in numerous and well-conducted troops the whooping crane grus americana is white primaries black and with black shafts the whole crown and cheeks bald the stately crane the largest of all the feathered tribes in the united states is met with in almost every part of north america dwelling amidst marshes and dark and desolate swamps it retires to the west indies to pass the winter though some have been known to linger through the whole of the inclement season in the swamps of new jersey near cape may 
the herons ardea are more carnivorous and are recognized by their larger toes and by their strong beak which is cleft to beneath the eyes and acuminated they are gloomy birds and build their nests in swamps along the banks of the rivers they feed on fish frogs moles insects etc the tribe is divided into herons properly so called boatbills cancroma etc the beak in the first is higher than it is wide and in the second flattened and very broad herons properly so called ardea have the eyes surrounded by a naked membrane which extends to the beak the tarsi are scutellated etc the common heron ardea cinerea is a large bird the plumage of which is bluish ash colour with the front of the neck white sprinkled with black tears and the black tuft on the occiput it is almost always solitary and is often seen for hours together on the same spot standing motionless on one foot the body almost straight the neck bent and the beak resting on one shoulder it is gloomy and timid and in general flies during the night when it utters a harsh sharp cry its flight is not rapid but very powerful and it can soar to an immense height its depredations on the fishes of european rivers render it highly prejudicial it is celebrated on account of the sport which the wealthy in former times derived from hunting it with falcons the crab-eater is a species of heron of small size which is found in the mountainous districts of france it frequents the vicinity of ponds the name of egrets is given to certain herons the feathers of which on the lower part of the back at a certain period are long and fringed the most beautiful species the feathers of which are used for ornamental purposes are the great and the little egret their plumage is entirely white and they are met with in europe the bitterns and night herons also belong to this tribe the tribe of storks is characterized by a larger and smoother beak than the preceding and by strong almost equal palmate membranes betwixt the bases of the toes the storks properly so called ciconia have a large beak which is moderately cleft their light and broad mandibles by striking against each other produce a peculiar clash their legs are reticulated and not very muscular their movements are slow and their steps long and measured in their powerful and sustained flight they carry their head stiffly in advance and their legs extended behind serve them for a rudder the white stork ardea ciconia appears in france and germany in the spring and passes the winter in africa it is a large white bird with the primaries of the wings black and the beak and feet red they live in pairs and return every year to lay in the same nest there is no bird which has received from different nations more universal protection than this which is in fact everywhere useful in ridding the soil of prejudicial animals without at the same time doing the smallest injury among the ancients this veneration was carried to such an extent that it was made a crime to kill one of these birds in thessaly it was even punishable by death like the ibis the stork was an object of worship amongst the egyptians and its instinctive qualities have no doubt contributed to increase this respect which is perpetuated among the orientals and still observed in switzerland and holland it has so much affection for its young that it does not quit them in the greatest danger it is recorded in history that the stork of delft which was uselessly urged to carry away her young remained and perished with them in the conflagration of that city 
the tender attentions which these birds pay to their parents in old age are not less remarkable and it is for this reason that the greeks have their name to the law which obliges children to furnish aliment to their parents when they are in want some species of storks have on the middle of the neck an appendage which resembles a large sausage on account of which they are called pouched storks the feathers from beneath their wings form those light plumes which are called by the french marabou one species is found in senegal and another in india the spoonbills platalea resemble the storks in their whole structure but their beak from which they derive their name is flat and widened at the end into a round disc like a spatula this conformation permits them to feed only on little animals which they obtain either by rooting in the mud or fishing in the water one species is spread throughout the eastern continent and another is proper to south america family of longerostres the longerostres have a long slender and feeble beak which is only suitable for rooting in the mud in search of worms and small insects these crelatoriae form two tribes snipes in which the beak is straight or curved downwards and the avocets in which the beak is curved upwards the first of these groups is composed of the ibis and curlews in which the beak is arcuate and snipes properly so called sandpipers the ruffs and a great number of other birds in which the beak is straight the ibises have the beak arcuate a part of the head and even a part of the neck destitute of feathers the external toes perceptibly palmate and the thumb sufficiently long to rest on the ground species of the ibis inhabit all quarters of the world they frequent the borders of rivers and lakes where they are accustomed to feed on insects crustacea worms and shellfish to which they also at times add vegetables but we may place among popular fables the reputation they have long enjoyed of being the great destroyers of serpents and venomous reptiles which in fact they never touch they migrate periodically to such distances that the boundaries of the earth alone seem to set limits to their wanderings natal a species of this genus the sacred ibis ibis religiosa is celebrated on account of the religious worship it received among the ancient egyptians it was reared in the temples of that country and embalmed after its death according to some these honours were rendered to the ibis because it devoured serpents which might have become dangerous to the country and according to others because its appearance announced the rise of the nile it is often seen sculptured on the monuments of that remarkable people it is a bird of about the size of a hen the plumage is white except the ends of the primaries of the wings which are black and the beak and the feet as well as the naked portion of the head and neck which are also black this species is found throughout africa the curlews numenius have the beak arcuated like that of the ibis but it is more slender and round throughout the tip of the upper mandible extends beyond the end of the lower one and projects a little downwards in front of it the toes are palmated at the base they are met with on our own coasts the snipes properly so called scolopax have a straight beak a compressed head with large eyes placed far back and the feet are not palmated they are singularly stupid in appearance which is not contradicted by their habits the common woodcock of europe scolopax rusticola inhabits lofty mountains during the summer and descends into the woods about the middle of october it goes alone or in pairs particularly in bad weather and seeks worms and insects in the soil the american woodcock 
scolopex minor differs from the european species in the temperature of the climate selected for its residence it is met with in summer between the river st lawrence and the limits of the middle states and in the winter retires to or beyond the boundary of the union it revisits pennsylvania early in march the sensibility of the end of the beak as in the snipe is sufficiently acute to enable it to collect its food by the sense of touch without using the eyes the snipe scolopax gallinago is smaller than the preceding it inhabits marshes the bank of rivulets etc two other species are found in france the great snipe and jack snipe all these birds are excellent to eat the american species closely resemble those of europe the avocets recurvirostra are distinguished by their long beak which is slender elastic and curved upwards and by their feet being palmate almost to the ends of their toes there is one species in europe the american avocet recurvirostra americana arrives on the coast of cape may in new jersey late in april and early in october retires with its young to winter in the south family of macrodactyli the gradatoriae composing this family never have the beak as slender and as weak as it is in the longerostries but in other respects its form varies very much they are chiefly characterized by the arrangement of their toes which are very long fitted for walking on the grass of marshes or even for swimming in which case they are widened by a species of lateral border but they never possess the smallest trace of a palmate membrane the thumb is always quite long the body is singularly compressed and their wings are moderate or short and their flight is feeble some of them the jackanets for example have the wings armed with a spur others are destitute of this kind of spur they are distinguished into rails and coots according as the front is feathered or furnished with a horny shield the rails rallus, have the front feathered the beak compressed and nearly straight the head small the toes destitute of lateral festoons and the wings concave they ordinarily keep concealed beneath the grass during the day and seek their food in the morning and evening amidst the rushes and herbs of marshes and prairies the water rail of europe rallus aquaticus is fawn-coloured brown spotted with blackish above bluish ash colour beneath and striped black and white on the flanks its flesh has a marshy odour it is common along rivulets and ponds it swims well and runs lightly over the leaves of aquatic plants the clapper rail or mud hen rallus crepitans abounds in the middle and southern states it is very numerous on the extensive salt marshes of new jersey where they are intersected by numerous tide-water ditches it winters near to or within the southern boundaries of the union the cracks or land rail rallus cracks is vulgarly called the king of the quails because from the circumstance of arriving and departing with them and keeping on the same grounds it was believed that he led them it lives and nests in the fields and runs through the grass with great rapidity the coots fulica are readily distinguished from the rails by a sort of horny plate which extends from the base of the beak and covers the forehead this genus comprises the water hens gallinula which are characterized by their very long toes furnished with a narrow border in general they live singly or in couples sometimes in small troops of three or four on stagnant waters they swim and dive readily during a great part of the day they keep concealed amongst reeds and rushes and venture only upon the surface of the waters at night 
their flight during which their legs are pendant is neither lofty sustained nor rapid there is one species widely spread in europe the american coots resemble those of europe family of flamingos this division of the order of grallatoriae is composed of a single genus which is very remarkable for the singular structure of its beak and the disproportionate length of the legs and neck flamingos phoenicopterus are large birds that stand high on their legs they have palmate feet and extremely long slender neck a small head the upper mandible flat and suddenly bent down at its middle to be applied over the lower mandible which is oval and longitudinally hollowed into a semi-cylindrical canal the edges of both mandibles are furnished with very delicate little transverse plates like those of ducks and their tongue is thick and fleshy they live on shellfish insects and the eggs of fishes which they obtain by means of their long neck and by bending down the head to use the hook of the upper mandible to advantage the most common species is spread over the eastern continent as far as the fortieth degree of north latitude numerous troops are seen every year on the southern shores of france and sometimes they ascend as far as the river rhine the red flamingo phoenicopterus ruber is from three to four feet high of a purple red on the back and rose-colored wings its habits are very remarkable these birds are always in troops and they form a line for the purpose of fishing and this disposition to be in file remains even when they repose on the shore they appoint a sentinel for their common security whether fishing or at rest one of them is always on the lookout with head erect and if anything alarms him he utters a braying cry resembling the sound of a trumpet which is the signal for departure as soon as the troop rises and when they fly they still preserve the line the manner in which they construct their nest is also worthy of attention they ordinarily build on drowned or wet shores they construct it on the water's edge of marsh mud in the form of a sugar loaf truncated at the top about twenty inches high and as they cannot on account of the extreme length of their legs squat in their nests they straddle over it the legs hanging down on each side and resting on the ground the ancients esteemed the flesh of the flamingos very highly and its fleshy tongue was particularly prized by the romans but the moderns who have had occasion to eat these birds have found the flesh oily and disagreeable the glarioles and vaginals or sheath bills offer nothing very interesting the first are found in all the northern parts of the eastern continent and the second in new holland end of lesson seven lesson eight of the elements of ornithology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rochenberger. Lesson 8. Order of Palmipedes. Zoological Characters, Habits, Division into Four Families. Family of Divers, Grebes, Ox, Penguins. Family of Longipines, Petrels, Albatross, Gulls, Sea Swallows. Family of Totipalmitae, genus of pelicans, pelican properly so called, organization, habits, frigate bird, boobies, family of lamellirostres, genus of ducks, swans, geese, ducks, eiders, genus of the mergansers. Order of Palmipedes. This name is given to birds in which the toes are united by a palmate membrane but in other respects without the conformation that belongs to the gralatoriae every palmipedes has in fact the interval 
which separates the toes filled up by a broad membrane which envelops them to near the nail or in other words they are webbed footed their feet are made for natation that is they are placed far back on the body and sustained by strong compressed tarsi a close lustrous plumage imbued with an oily fluid and a thick down next to the skin protect them against the water upon which they dwell they are the only animals of this class in which the neck exceeds and sometimes very much the length of the feet for the reason that when swimming on the surface of the water they often have to seek animals upon which they feed in its depths the localities which they inhabit removes most of them from the empire of man and in many respects even from the investigation of naturalists birds of this order generally possess a system of organization which is strong and appropriate for extensive flight their sternum is very long affording ample protection to most of their viscera and has but one notch or oval hole on each side which is filled by membranes so that this bone affords a wide surface for the attachment of the depressor muscles of the wings this order is divided into four families according to the following characteristics palmipedes having excessively short wings and the legs placed so far back that they are obliged when on land to preserve an almost vertical position they fly little or not at all family of brachyterae or divers palmipedes having the wings of ordinary length or even very long and the feet so placed as to enable the animal to walk when in a horizontal position family of longipines the beak is horny the thumb free or wanting wings excessively long family of totipalmate the beak is horny the thumbs united to the outer toes by a common membrane wings long family of mammillarostres the beak covered by a soft skin and the edges furnished with transverse lamellae or very fine teeth family of brachyterae or divers they have the legs placed farther back than all other birds which renders it laborious for them to walk and generally obliges them to keep in an erect position when on land as most of them fly badly and as many of them cannot even fly at all in consequence of the extreme shortness of their wings they may be regarded as belonging almost exclusively to the surface of the water their plumage is very close in structure and even frequently presents a smooth surface and a silvery brightness they swim perfectly with a body entirely under water and use their wings almost as if they were fins this family is divided into three tribes namely the divers in which the beak is moderate strong straight very pointed and compressed and the nostrils are lateral linear and half closed by membrane the ox in which the beak is very compressed trenchant and ordinarily furrowed transversely the penguins in which the beak is pointed or hooked and the wings are furnished only with feathers which are so short that they resemble scales the divers are subdivided into divers properly so called grebes guillemots etc the divers properly so called colimbus are recognized by their long toes which are entirely palmate and armed with pointed nails the thumb is short and provided with a small membrane their tail is very short and round these birds never quit the water except during the season of laying and then they walk by the assistance of their wings if these supports fail them they fall upon the belly and have great difficulty in rising they keep habitually under water and scarcely show anything but the head to breathe from time to time they fly well but rarely and dive at the flash of a gun without attempting to fly they feed on fishes spawn and aquatic insects the most common of its tribe in the united states is the loon or great northern diver colimbus glacialis the grebes podichapes in place of true palmate membranes have toes widened like the grala horiae of the genus bullica and the anterior ones being united only at the base by membranes they live on lakes and ponds and build among the rushes they swim with ease and die frequently the semi-metallic lustre of their plumage has caused their skin to be applied to the same use as fur there are several species in europe which are not well distinguished the largest is of the size of a duck the smallest is not larger than a quail the name of guillemots uria is given to divers that want the thumb and that have shorter wings than the preceding birds of the tribe of ox alca have a broad straight compressed beak which is very much curved at the point the nostrils which are about the middle of the beak are almost closed by a membrane covered with feathers 
the feet are short and have only three toes and are completely palmate the nails are slightly curved they have the same habits as the birds of the preceding genera and like them inhabit the north with the exception of a single species they all fly but little and always grazing or lightly touching the surface of the water the razor-billed auk alca torda inhabits the coldest regions of the northern hemisphere it is gregarious in its habits and flies rapidly but near the surface of the water great auk or northern penguin alca impenis inhabits the highest latitude of the globe dwelling by choice and instinct amidst regions covered with eternal ice its wings are extremely short and useless for flight the tribe of penguins aptenodites comprises palmipedes not one of which can fly their little wings are covered with mere vestiges of feathers which at first sight resemble scales their feet which are placed farther back than in any other bird only support them when they rest upon the tarsus which is widened like the sole of a foot of a quadruped they have a small thumb directed inwards and the three anterior toes are united by a membrane these birds never quit the water except to lay and then they are obliged to drag themselves along on the belly they are only found in the antarctic seas great penguin aptenodites pathagonica is the size of a goose slate color above with a black mask and a lemon-colored tail family of longipenes this family contains birds of the high seas which from their power of extensive flight are everywhere found and which navigators meet with in every latitude they have sharp slender wings their pectoral muscles are very powerful their feet are widely palmate which better enables them to repose upon the waves and their piercing sight inevitably prevents the escape of fishes of which they are very fond and which they seize not by diving but by skimming the surface these birds are frequently met at incredible distances from land and they are seldom seen beyond the limits of the zone which they inhabit through preference they are recognized by the freedom of thumb or its entire absence by their very long wings and by their beak which is without teeth hooked or simply pointed the following exhibits the characteristics of the principal genera composing this family longipennies having the nostrils in the form of a tube petrels a nail planted in the heel and taking the place of a thumb albatrosses without a vestige of a thumb longipennies having the nostrils oblong and pierced in different places gulls legs pretty long tail not forked sea swallows legs very short tail generally forked beak compressed of the ordinary form skimmers legs very short tail generally forked beak like the blades of a pair of scissors the petrels procellaria have a beak hooked at the end the extremity of which seems to consist of a distinct piece articulated with the remainder their nostrils are united in a tube laid on the back of the upper mandible in place of a thumb there is a nail planted in the heel of all the palmipedes these remain the most consistently at distance from land and when a tempest supervenes they are often forced to seek shelter on reefs and ships which circumstances obtain for them the name storm birds that of petrel little peter is given to them it is said from their habit of walking on the water by the assistance of their wings which reminds us of the miracle of saint peter walking on the lake of genesaret they build their nest in holes in rocks and they eject upon those that attack them an oily fluid with which their stomach appears to be always filled the greatest number of species inhabit the seas of the antarctic pole these birds are nocturnal they seek their food only in the morning or evening twilight during the day they lie concealed in caverns and clefts of rocks they feed on the bodies of dead cetacea mollusca and worms that float on the surface of the water to this genus belong the stormy petrels or mother carries chickens procellaria pelagica cape pigeons etc the albatrosses the omeda have a very long very strong hard trenchant and compressed beak which is straight at the base and suddenly curved towards the end the nostrils are tubular and placed in a furrow the feet are short and palmate they have but three toes the nails are short and dull the albatrosses are the largest of all oceanic birds their heavy massive form seems to bear very little relation to their rapid and long continued flight which has caused them to be called by mariners cape sheep 
or man-of-war birds the species best known is white with black wings of all birds this one is seen at the greatest distance from land it generally inhabits extra-tropical latitudes and is chiefly in those seas which wash the three great southern capes that it is most commonly seen it was for a long time believed that it belonged exclusively to the southern hemisphere and was never seen in the north the genus of gulls laurus have a moderate entire beak which is naked at the base the upper mandible is curved at the point and the inferior swelled and angular beneath the nostrils are median and longitudinal the tarsi are pretty long and naked above the knee the thumb which is articulated high up is sometimes without a nail the tail is rectilinear and the wings are long the name of good lens or gulls properly so called is given to large species the size of which exceeds that of a duck while the smaller species are called muetis muetis inhabit the seashore of all parts of the globe they are clamorous and voracious they feed on fishes and small animals as well as on carrion and dead bodies their gluttony is such that they may be easily taken by enveloping a hook with feathers which floating on the surface in their eyes resembles a little fish the sea swallows or terns sterna derive their name from their excessively long wings and forked tail which give them the appearance of common swallows their beak is as long or longer in the head almost straight compressed trenchant acute at the point and both mandibles are of equal length the nostrils are about the middle of the beak the feet are small naked above the knee the tarsi are very short and the anterior toes are united by a membrane their nails are small and arcuate these birds fly a great deal rarely alight upon the water and do not swim they feed on little fishes or insects which they seize as they fly skimming the surface of the water all birds of this genus are clothed in white with the back wings and tail pearl gray the skimmers cutwaters or shearwaters rind chops are remarkable for the singular form of their beak the lower mandible of which is longer than the upper both being flattened so as to form simple blades which meet without clasping they inhabit the west indies the cutwater or black skimmer rind chops nigra is a bird of passage in the united states it arrives from its winter quarters about the middle of may on the seashores of new jersey where it breeds its favorite haunts are along the low sandbars and dry flats of the strand in the immediate vicinity of the ocean family of totipalmitae the birds of this family are remarkable for having the thumb united to the other toes in the same membrane and notwithstanding this organization which converts their feet into excellent paddles they are the only birds among the palmipedes that perch on trees they all fly well and have short feet the characters of the most important genre of this family are toti palmitae having a large cutaneous pouch or sac suspended between the branches of the lower mandible pelicans toti palmitae without a sac beneath the lower jaw cormorants the beak straight compressed and hooked at the end tail round of fourteen quills frigate birds the beak straight compressed and hooked at the end tail forked boobies the beak straight compressed and hooked at the end tail pointed darters etc beak straight slender and pointed the pelicans pelicanus having a long straight broad beak which is very much depressed the upper mandible is flattened and hooked the lower one is formed of two bony branches between which hangs a large pouch of naked skin the face and throat are naked the feet are strong and short and all the toes are united by a single membrane these singular animals are expert swimmers and are found both on salt and fresh waters they feed on fishes and can store an ample supply of them in their pouch which is prodigiously dilatable they are spread over the warm temperate and even the most frigid climates of the globe and one of the species the common pelican may be considered a cosmopolite the common pelicans pelicanus onocrotalis sometimes called onocrotalis because its voice has been compared to the braying of an ass the largest web-footed waterfowl known is five or six feet long with an alar spread of twelve feet the beak alone is about a foot and a half in length and its pouch will contain a dozen quarts of water its plumage is more or less purely white according to its age and the remiges are black it flies well and sometimes rises to a great height but in general it skims the surface of the water or balances at a moderate elevation in order to precipitate itself more readily upon its prey 
sometimes it is seen to beat the water with its wings as if to disturb it and alarm the fishes and we are assured when pelicans are assembled in troops they fish in company by forming a large circle which they gradually reduce to imprison the fishes until at a given signal they all strike the water at the same time and under favor of the confusion dive in and seize their victims the fishing over they retire to some rocky point or shoal and there digest their gluttonous meal at their ease they could perch on trees which is very rare among the web-footed birds but they do not nest in them they build on the ground in an excavation which they line with herbs the female lays from four to six eggs and feeds her young by disgorging before them the fishes which she brings in her pouch for their use it is also said that she carries them water in the same way and it is probable that the movement which she makes to empty her pouch by pressing it against her breast has given rise to the fable referred by some writers to the pretended habit which these birds had of opening their breasts to feed their young family on their own blood the cormorants phala cocorax have an elongated compressed beak the upper mandible hooked at the end the skin of the throat is but little dilatable and does not form a pouch as in the pelicans the nail of the middle toe is toothed like a saw and the tail which consists of fourteen feathers is round they are excellent divers they ordinarily swim with only the head above water and they pursue fishes upon which they feed with astonishing rapidity entirely under water their flight is rapid and sustained but on land they walk badly and sustain themselves almost in a vertical position by the assistance of the tail the common cormorant is of the size of a goose and its plumage is greenish black it inhabits the northern countries of both continents it nests sometimes in rocky clefts and sometimes on trees or among rushes and feeds chiefly on eels the shags belong to this group the frigate birds tachypates also differ from pelicans in the absence of the submaxillary pouch in their forked tail and in their short feet the membranes of which are deeply notched they have long wings that spread to a great extent and a beak both mandibles of which are curved at the end these birds only inhabit intertropical regions and their flight is so powerful and rapid that they fly to great distances from land and for this reason they have obtained the name of man-of-war birds they are met with more than four hundred leagues at sea and they wage an active war against the flying fish which in order to escape from the pursuit of other fishes springs entirely out of the water frigate birds also pursue boobies and by striking them with their wings and beak force them to disgorge the product of their fishing which they dexterously seize before it falls into the water the boobies sula very much resemble the preceding but their beak is straight slightly arcuate at the point and armed on the edges with teeth the points of which are directed backwards the throat as well as the vicinity of the eyes is naked but little extensible the wings are less than those of the frigate bird and the tail is a little wedge-shaped they obtain their name of boobies from the stupidity they display on submitting to the attacks of man and animals the darters plotus resemble the cormorants in the form of their body and their feet but are distinguished from them by the length of their neck their small head and by their straight slender pointed beak which is dentate on the edges they inhabit the warm countries of both hemispheres and their habits are nearly the same as those of the preceding the tropic birds phaeton differ from the other totopalmitae in having the head entirely feathered and by the two long straight feathers of the tail which at a distance resemble straws they seldom resort to the land except to breed and rarely quit the torrid zone their appearance is an indication to navigators of their vicinity to that region the family of lamely rostres the palmipedes of this family have a thick beak covered with soft skin rather than true horn and its edges are furnished with lamellae or little teeth the tongue is large and fleshy and dentate on its edges they have three toes in front united by membranes and one behind which is free their wings are of moderate length and they live more on fresh waters than at sea they are divided into the following manner lamellae rostres having the beak very broad and the edges furnished with lamellae tribe of ducks swans beak higher than wide at its base and not narrowing in front neck very long geese beak higher than wide at its base and narrowing in the front neck of moderate length ducks properly so called beak not so high as it is wide at its base neck pretty short limula rostre having the beak slender and armed with little teeth tribe of mergansers all of the palmipedes of the tribe of ducks which naturalists distinguish under the name of anas 
have a moderate strong straight beak which is more or less depressed convex above flat below rounded at the end and terminated by a smooth scale in the form of a nail the edges of each mandible are armed with little projecting lamellae which are delicate and placed transversely and seem designed to permit the escape of water after the animal has ceased its prey their food consists of fishes mollusca insects grains etc to obtain their nourishment some submerge themselves entirely while others remain on the surface and only plunge in their head and long neck they are seldom on land this tribe is composed of swans geese and ducks properly so called the swans cygnus are the largest birds in this group and are distinguished by the form of the beak which is as wide in the front as it is behind and higher than it is wide at its base they feed chiefly on grains and the roots of aquatic plants they swim with such facility that a man walking rapidly along shore would have difficulty in keeping up with them and they fly with a great deal of lightness and strength whether on the water or in the air they are almost always seen in troops the young quit the nest swim and eat alone immediately after they are hatched their down which is very fine serves for many purposes their plumage is generally white these birds have long been celebrated for the beauty of their form and for the grace with which they swim the trachea is bent on the sternum but their voice is not rendered therefore more agreeable and the ancients have very gratuitously given celebrity to the song of the swan in new holland there is a black swan which is the size of the common species but its carriage is less graceful and elegant geese answer have a moderate or short beak narrower before than behind and higher than wide in space their legs which are longer than those of ducks properly so called and placed nearer to the middle of the body give them greater facility in walking they feed on aquatic plants and grains they live almost constantly on the great humid prairies and vast marshes wild geese live in numerous troops and always have some of them on the watch they are extremely suspicious the males are not distinguishable from the females by the color of their plumage they molt but once a year their voice is strong and clamorous they breed on the ground swim little and do not dive at all they fly in flocks in two lines in the form of an angle or in a single line when the troop is numerous the one which is at the point of the angle or at the head of the line falls into the rear when fatigued and they all succeed each other in turn ducks properly so called anis comprise species almost all of which resemble each other but still differ in slight particulars they differ from swans and geese not only in their beak but also in being much smaller and having a shorter neck the trachea is flattened at its bifurcation ducks are spread through all the marshy or maritime countries of the globe they are aquatic and migratory and approach the sea coast in flocks during the autumn and winter but frequent freshwater ponds lakes and rivers particularly those with grassy sedgy borders they prefer shallow places in which they can fathom the bottom with the beak without the necessity of diving deeply to which they only have recourse in the breeding season or to avoid their enemies the species are numerous but they are most abundant in the temperate regions ducks are divided into sea ducks eiders common ducks teals etc the common duck has been long domesticated and inhabits all our poultry yards the canvas back duck anis valisneria so well known as a delicacy of the table is a species peculiar to the continent of america it is of a steel gray beak straight nearly two and a half inches long its sides parallel the male is white waved with black the head tinged with black anteriorly and the glossy neck chestnut a black pectoral belt female dull whitish waved with black head neck and breast brownish the eider anis molissima or somateria is a species of duck celebrated for the down in which it furnishes known under the name of eider down the male is nearly two feet long and its alar extent is about two feet eight inches it is whitish with the front and the sides of the crown belly and tail black the female which is smaller is gray speckled brown clothed in thick fur the eiders brave the rigors of the coldest countries and advance as far as spitzbergen the down which they pluck from the breast and belly to line their nest is sought for with a great deal of pains in those countries where these birds are common it is the softest the lightest the warmest and the most elastic of all downs that which is plucked from the dead bird is of inferior quality the genus of mergansers mergus comprises those helmipedi lemurostris that have a moderate or long straight slender beak 
in the form of an elongated and almost cylindrical cone wide at the base and at the point of the upper mandible is very much curved and hooked the edges of both mandibles are serrated and the teeth are directed backwards the nostrils are about the middle of the beak the feet are short the toes are entirely palmate the posterior toe is free and has a border these birds swim perfectly often having only their head above water and they dive still better their flight is rapid and sustained but from the posterior position of their feet they are scarcely capable of walking tottering from side to side with the utmost embarrassment in other respects they resemble ducks they dwell habitually in cold countries and are only seen commonly in temperate climates on the approach of winter of the five species known one is peculiar to america the hooded merganser murgus cuculatus and all are found on this continent end of lesson eight end of the elements of ornithology by william ruschenberger section ten of the elements of ornithology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle the elements of ornithology by william rochenberger glossary part one a through e abdomen from the latin abdere to conceal the belly the chief viscera contained in the abdomen are the stomach intestines liver etc accipiteris from the latin accipere to seize hold of systematic name of the order of birds of prey accumulate accumulated from the latin acumen a sharp point ending in a point aanthe from the greek aemi which is from eo or eo to agitate and antha a flower aden from the greek adon a songster which is derived from ado i sing a term applied to many birds aerial from the latin arius belonging to the air aeruginosus latin rusty acelon a kind of falcon Estiva, Latin belonging or relating to summer. Alar, extent, from the Latin ala, a wing, belonging or relating to the wings, a term used in speaking of the stretch of the expanded wings. Alauda, Latin a lark. Albino, Spanish, formed from the Latin albus, white. This word is employed to designate those individuals of the human race who have the skin and hair white the iris very pale and bordering on red or pink and the eyes so sensible that they cannot bear the light of day the word is also applied to animals of the lower orders that are similarly characterized alca the systematic name of a tribe of web-footed birds alcedo the latin name of the kingfisher alcyon from the greek alcunon which is formed from the alts the sea and kuo i produce the halcyon the name of a fabulous bird of the ancients which was supposed to build its nest on the sea at a season when it was presumed to be calm this season embraced a period of fourteen days which are called the halcyon days the specific name of a kingfisher alector from the greek alctor the domestic cock alpestris latin belonging or relating to the alps americana americanus modern latin belonging or relating to america ampelis from the greek ampe leon a singing bird the systematic name of the crown birds analogous from the greek ana between and logos reason having some resemblance or relation though differing in essential particulars similar anis from the greek nessa a duck which is formed from neo i swim the systematic name of the tribe of ducks ankylost from the greek agkulos crooked a joint that has become stiff and immovable is said to be ankylost answer latin a goose anthus latin the name of the titlark or meadowlark apparatus latin ad for and pare to prepare 
a collection of instruments or organs for any operation whatsoever an assemblage of organs in latin this word is the same in the plural but in english some writers make the plural apparatuses apiaster modern latin formed from apis a bee the specific name of the common bee-eater apivorus from the latin apis a bee and vorare to eat bee-eating one that eats bees appendices the plural of appendix appendix latin ad to and pendere to hang something added any part that adheres to an organ or is continuous with it apoda from the greek a without and pus in the genitive podos a foot without feet applied to birds of paradise because it was once supposed they had no feet aptenodites from the greek a primitive tenos winged having the power of flying and dutes a diver the systematic name of penguins apus latin specific name of the common martin aquaticus latin aquatic relating or belonging to water aquila latin an eagle ara aracari systematic names of a macaw archipelago from the greek arca beginning and pelagios sea an extent of sea sprinkled with islands arcuate from the latin arcuo i bend like a bow bent like a bow bow shaped ardea latin a heron argonauts from the greek argo the name of a vessel and nautis a navigator the name of the ancient grecian princes who sailed on board of the ship argo with jason to conquer the golden fleece argus the name of a hero in mythology who is said to have had a hundred eyes fifty of which were open while the other fifty slept after his death juno changed him into a peacock from the spots on his tail sometimes called eyes the name has been applied to a species of pheasant articulate from the latin articulus which is the diminutive of artus a limb which is derived from the greek arthron a joint to join or joint in form words to utter articulation a joint arvenus latin formed from arvum a field relating or belonging to fields astor systematic name of the goshawks aura latin an air or emanation the specific name of a kind of vulture auratus latin gilded golden belonging or relating to gold barb from the latin barba a beard the filaments which are attached to two sides of the stalk of a feather are called barbs or beards barbul the diminutive of barb and is applied to designate the filaments which are found on the edges of barbs composing a feather barbarous latin foreign barbarous cruel barbatus latin bearded having a beard base of support the space comprised between the points by which an object supports itself upon a resistant body beak the bill or horny mouth of a bird becfigu french name of the titlark becafica italian name of the titlark bicolor latin parti-colored bifid from the latin bis twice infindere to split to split or divide into two separate parts bifurcate from the latin bis twice and fuca a fork divided or separated into two branches bifurcation from the latin bis twice and fuca a fork the point where two branches separate bombicilla from the greek bombux a silkworm the systematic name of the chatterers brachytere from the greek brachus short and teron a wing having short wings the systematic name of a family of divers brevipennes from the latin brevis short and penna a wing having short wings the systematic name of a family of the order of wading birds bronchia the singular of bronchiae from the greek brokos the throat the two branches of the windpipe which convey air to the lungs 
Ubo, Latin, an owl. Bucheros, from the Latin, bucuros, horned. The systematic name of the callos, or hornbills. Bulb, from the Greek bulbos, a round root, a name given by anatomists to various parts which resemble certain bulbous roots in shape. Bulbous, Latin, a bulb, bulbus glandulosus, is the second stomach of birds. Bufaja, from the Greek bus, an ox, and phagian, to eat, systematic name of the beef eaters. Buteo, Latin, a buzzard. Californianus, Latin, Californian. Callus, from the Latin callus, hardness, that which is hard or indurated. Camellus, Latin, camel. Canadensis, Latin, Canadian, belonging or relating to Canada. Canaria, Latin, belonging or relating to the Canary Islands. Cancroma, the generic name of the boat bills. Cannabina, Latin, belonging or relating to hemp. The specific name of the linnet. Caprimogulus, Latin, a milker of goats systematic name of the goat suckers which is derived from a notion entertained by the vulgar of their sucking goats and even cows caravan from the persian kara owan an assemblage of persons travelling together a troop of travellers merchants or pilgrims who for greater security cross deserts and other places infested by arabs and highwaymen in company cardia from the greek cardia the heart the left opening of the stomach where the esophagus enters it. Carduelis, Latin, a bird feeding among thistles. Specific name of the goldfinch. Carnios, from the Latin caro, in the genitive carnis, flesh, belonging or relating to flesh, fleshy. Carnivorous, from the Latin caro, carnis, flesh, and voro, I eat. Animals that feed on flesh are said to be carnivorous. Carolinensis, Latin Carolinian, belonging to Carolina. Carpal, belonging or relating to the carpus. Carpus, from the Greek carpos, the wrist, the part between the forearm and hand. Cartilage, gristle, a solid part of the animal body of medium consistence between bone and ligament. Cartilaginous, partaking of the nature of cartilage. Caruncle, from the Latin caruncula, the diminutive of caro, flesh, a small portion of flesh, a fleshy excreance, the gills of a cock, for example. Cassuarius, Latin, a cassowary. Cassowary, from the Malay name of this bird, cassuaris. Cathartis, from the Greek cathartis, one who purifies, the generic name of certain vultures. Center of gravity, the name given to the point about which all points of the body reciprocally balance each other. Cira cirae, a colored membrane investing the base of the upper mandible, as in hawks and a few other birds. Chirthia, the systematic name of the creepers. Cervical, from the Latin cervix, the neck, belonging or relating to the neck. Cetacea, in Latin, cetaceous which is formed from the Greek kitos, a whale. Naturalists use the word to designate pisciform mammals that have fins in place of feet and inhabit the sea. Caradrius, Latin, a bird, the seeing of which, it was supposed, cured those that had the jaundice. The generic name of the plover. Kitura, systematic name of the swifts. Chyle, from the Greek kulos, nutritious juice a nutritive fluid of whitest appearance, which is extracted from food by the action of the digestive organs. Chyliferous, from the Latin chylos, chyle, and ferro, I carry, carrying or conveying chyle. Chaconia, Latin, a stork. Ciliated, tongue, when the tongue is edged with fine bristles, as in ducks. Chinklos, from the Greek chinklos, name of a bird, Generic name of the water thrush. Cineracius, cinere, cinereos, formed from the Latin cineres, ashes, belonging or relating to ashes, ashy, ash colored. 
Circus, Latin, a gentle falcon, the generic name of the harriers. Citronella, Latin, formed from citrus, a citron tree, the specific name of the yellow bunting. Clavicle, from the Latin clavis, a key, the collarbone. Cleft, the space made by separation of parts, a crack, a crevice, the line of separation betwixt the two mandibles shows to what distance the beak is cleft from its point. Cloaca, from the Greek kluzo, I wash, the pouch at the extremity of the intestinal canal, in which the solid and liquid excretions are commingled in birds, fishes, and reptiles. Cocothrostes, from the Greek kokos, a kernel, a grain and tharao, I break, the systematic name of the gross beaks. Kika or keka, plural of kikum. Kikum or kakum, from the Latin kakos, blind, the blind gut, so called from its being perforated at one end only. Celebs, Latin, unmarried, solitary, lonely. Colorio, from the Greek kolao, I join or fasten together. The specific name of the butcher bird. Colubris, the specific name of a humming bird. Columba, Latin, a pigeon. Columbus, from the Greek columbao, I dive, systematic name of the divers. Commissaire, from the Latin comito, I join together. A point of union between two parts, the point where the two mandibles are joined, is called the commissaire of the beak. Communis, Latin, common. Compressed, beak, flattened at the sides vertically. Concha, the hollow part of the cartilage of the external ear. Conirostres, from the Latin conus, a cone, and rostrum, a beak. The systematic name of a family of passerine birds. Coracoid, from the Greek corax, a crow, and eidos, resemblance. Resembling the beak of a crow, the coracoid bone is a posterior clavicle of birds. Corax, Latin, a raven. Cornu, Latin, a horn. Corvus, Latin, a crow. Cosmopolite, from the Greek cosmos world and polites citizen a citizen of the world peculiar to no country coturnix latin a quail corsi a racehorse coverts the small feathers which lie in several rows on the bones of the wings are called the lesser coverts those that line the underside of the wings the under coverts those feathers that lie immediately over the quill feathers and secondaries are called the greater coverts, and the tail coverts are those feathers that cover the tail on the upper side at the base. Cranium. From the Greek cranon, head, the skull. Crepitanis. Latin, crackling, ringing, making a noise, rattling, chattering. Crepuscular. From the Latin crepusculum, twilight. Belonging or relating to twilight. Crack. From the Greek, crex, a bird, the rail. Cristatus. Latin, tufted, combed, crested, wearing a crest. Crustacea. From the Latin, crusta, a crust. A class of animals whose bodies are enclosed in a covering like a crab. Cuculatus. Latin, hooded, cowled. Cuculus. Latin, cuckoo. Cul-de-sac, French, a blind alley, literally a bag bottom. Cultratate, from the Latin culter, a knife, sharp and cutting on the edges. Cultria rostris, from the Latin culter, in the genitive cultri, a knife, and rostrum, beak. Systematic name of a family of Graliatore, characterized by a beak with sharp edges. Cuniate, from the Latin cunius, a wedge, wedge-shaped. Cuniform, from
from the latin cunus a wedge and forma form in the form of a wedge wedge shaped cupido latin desire appetite gluttony curuca latin a tomtit a hedge sparrow curvate bowed bent curvy rostra from the latin curvus bent bowed and rostrum beak having the beak bent or bowed cygnus latin a swan Sipsalus, latin a martin or swallow dentate from the latin dens a tooth toothed or notched denti rostres from the latin dens a tooth in the genitive dentis and rostrum beak systematic name of a family of passernic birds depressor muscles whose function is to depress certain parts are so called diaphragm from the greek diaphragma a partition the fleshier muscular partition between the cavity of the chest and the cavity of the abdomen diomedia the ancient name of certain birds of the island of diomedes near tarentum which are said to receive the greeks favorably and to attack barbarians the systematic name of the albatross disposition from the latin dispono i place or set in order arrangement or placing of parts diurnal from the latin dis day belonging or relating to the day diurne systematic name of a division of birds of prey doliconics from the greek dolikos long and onyx a nail a claw generic name of the rice bird domestica latin domestic duct thoracic the canal or duct which conveys the chyle into the blood echelette french a little ladder systematic name of the creepers emberiza generic name of the buntings erectile from the latin erigere to become erect susceptible of erection erythicus from the greek erythikos an unknown bird that was taught to imitate words the specific name of the gray parrot erythrocephalus from the greek erythros red and kephale head red-headed the systematic name of the woodpecker esculenta latin esculent edible europus latin european excubitor latin one that watches by night a sentinel extensile from the latin extendo i stretch susceptible of being extended or lengthened extensor muscles whose function is to extend certain parts are so called extremities from the latin extremis extreme the end of a thing the limbs the legs and arms in birds the legs and wings end of section ten section ten of the elements of ornithology this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle the elements of ornithology by william ruschenberger glossary part two f through o falco latin form from falx in the genitive falcus a hook a bill a scythe the falcon so called from the shape of its beak falconry the art of hunting with birds of prey familiaris latin familiar belonging or relating to a family domestic femur latin the thigh bone Ferruginous, Latin, ferruginous, of the color of rusty iron. Ferruginous, from the Latin, ferrugo, rust of iron, of the color of iron rust. Fici rostres, from the Latin, fissura, a slit, a fissure, which is formed from vendere, to cleave, to divide, and rostrum, a beak. Fisher beaks. 
systematic name of a family of passerine birds. Fossa, in the plural fossae, from the Latin fodio, I dig, a cavity of greater or less depth, the entrance to which is always larger than the base. The nasal fossae are two large cavities situate between the orbits below the cranium and lined by the pituitary or schneiderian membrane the internal nostrils fourchette french a fork the notch formed by the coracoid bones and sternum between the wings fringilla latin a chaffinch the systematic name of the finches front the forehead fulica latin a coot fulvus latin of a deep yellow or fawn color function from the latin fungor i act or discharge an office the action of an organ or system of organs fuscus latin brown Galbula, Latin, name of a bird. Galena che, formed from the Latin galena, a hen, the systematic name of an order of birds. Galenaceous, belonging or relating to or partaking of the nature of the galena che. Galinago, specific name of the snipe. Galinula. Systematic name of the water hens. Galinaza, Spanish, a turkey buzzard. Gallus, Latin, a cock. Garlus, Latin, chattering. Genus, Latin, a kindred, breed, race, stock, lineage, or family. Genera plural of genus generic belonging or relating to genus juror falcon from the latin gyrus a circuit and falco a falcon the falcon that flies in a circle a kind of falcon gibbous from the latin gibbous a bunch or swelling bulging or bunching out gizzard the strong muscular stomach of a bird Glacius, Latin glacial, relating to ice. Gland, a word applied to designate those softish, granular, lobated organs composed of vessels, nerves, and a particular structure which form peculiar secretions. Glandarius, Latin, belonging or relating to acorns. Glandulosus, Latin, full of glands. The bulbus glandulosus is a second stomach of birds. Glottis, a small, oblong aperture situate at the upper part of the larynx. Relatorie, from the Latin relator, he that walks on stilts, a stalker. The systematic name of wading birds. Granivorous, from the Latin granum, a grain of any kind of corn and volare, to eat, grain-eating. Granule, a very small grain. Gregarious, from the Latin gregarius, of a flock, which is formed from grex, in the genitive gregius, a flock or herd, going in flocks or herds. Griffin, from the Latin griffus, which is formed from the Greek grupus, curved, hooked, a fabulous monster, half lion, half bird. The systematic name of a tribe of birds of prey. Grus, Latin, a crane. Gryphus, Latin, a griffin. Gripatos, from the Greek, gupatos, a kind of eagle, formed from gups, a vulture, and aetos, an eagle. Gypogerinus, from the Greek goops, a vulture, and geronos, a bird, a crane. The generic name of the secretary. Hemoptopus, 
from the Greek amyoptopus, having a fierce or sanguinary look, formed from aima, blood, and ops, an eye, the generic name of the oyster catchers. Hellacious, from the Greek als, the sea, and eitos, an eagle, the specific name of the fisher eagle. Harpia, Latin, a harpy. Formed from the Greek arpis, rapacious. Heliaca, specific name of a sort of eagle. Herbivorous, from the Latin herba, herb or plant, and voare, to eat, herb eating. Animals that feed chiefly or entirely on herbs or plants are herbaceous. Hero falco, Latin, gerfalcon. Hirundo, Latin, a swallow. Hortulana, specific name of a bunting. Humerus, the bone of the arm, which is situated between the shoulder joint and the elbow. Hymalis, Latin, belonging or relating to winter. Hyoid, from the Greek, u, and eidos, resemblance, resembling the shape or form of the letter u. The os hyoides, the hyoid bone, is a very movable bony arch placed horizontally in the substance of the soft parts of the neck at the root of the tongue. It does not articulate with any other bone of the skeleton and is only connected to it through the medium of muscles and ligaments. Icterus, Latin, name of a yellow bird which, if one see being sick of the yellow jaundice, the person recovers and the bird dies. Systematic name of the oriole. Iliacus, systematic name of a kind of thrush. Impenis, Latin, formed from penna, a wing. Systematic name of the penguins, which have very short wings. Imperialis, Latin, imperial, royal. Incubation, from the Latin incubatio, the act of the female of the oviparous animals, in sitting and remaining on her eggs for the purpose of hatching them. Indigenous, from the Latin inde, where, and genitus, born, applied to the natives of a country, also to animals that inhabit the country where they are born. Ingluvies, Latin, the crop of a bird. Insectivorous, from the Latin insecta, insects, and vorare, to eat, insect eating. Animals that feed on insects are insect force. Invertebrate, without vertebrae. Iris, that part of the eye which the pupil is situate. Irides, plural of iris. Islandicus, Latin, belonging or relating to Iceland. Isolate, from the Italian isola, an island, because one who is isolated resembles an island entirely surrounded by water, separated, alone, single. Ispida, systematic name of a kingfisher. Jota, specific name of a vulture. Jugular, from the Latin jugulum, the throat, belonging or relating to the throat. Kinglet, a little king, a name of the wren. Lamergyer, German, lamb vulture. Lagopus, Latin, ptarmigan. Lamella, Latin, a little thin plate or piece. Lamelli, Latin, plural of lamella. Lamelli rostres, from the Latin lamella, a thin plate, and rostrum, beak. Systematic name of a family of birds. Lamina, Latin, a plate or thin piece of metal or bone. Lamellae, Latin, plural of lamina. Laneus, generic name of shrikes. Larva, Latin, a mask. An insect, after it has left the egg, and before it assumes the form of a chrysalis, 
is called the larva, because in this state it is, as it were, masked. Larvae. Latin, plural of larva. Laris. Latin, the sea mew or gull. Larnix. From the Greek, larux, a whistle, the apparatus of voice. It is situate at the superior and anterior part of the neck, and at the top of the trachea with which it communicates. Leucocephalus From the Greek, leucos, white, and kephale, head, white-headed, specific name of the bald eagle. Lithofalco From the Greek, lithos, a stone, and the Latin falco, a falcon, specific name of the merlin. Lobate, foot. Toes furnished on the sides with broad, plain membranes. Longipennies. From the Latin, longus, long, and penna, a wing. Long-winged. Systematic name of a family of web-footed birds. Longirostres. From the Latin, longus, long, and rostrum, beak. Long-beaked. Systematic name of a family of waders. Loon, the name of a bird, from loom, which in the language of the Laplander signifies lame, as it cannot walk well. Lore, a naked line leading from the beak to the eye. Loxia, from the Greek loxos, oblique, systematic name of the gross beaks. Luscinia, Latin, a nightingale. Macrodactyli, from the Greek macros, long, and dactulos, a finger, toe, long-fingered, systematic name of a tribe of wading birds. Menora, meora, generic name of the lyres, probably a corruption from the Greek, pandora, a musical instrument resembling a lute. Major, Latin, greater, larger. Mammal, any animal having teats for suckling its young is called a mammal. Mandibles. From the Latin, mandare, to chew, the jaws of birds. Marsupium. Latin, a pouch, a sack. Mastication. From the Greek, masticao, I chew. The act of chewing food to impregnate it with saliva and prepare it for the digestion which it has to undergo in the stomach. Melanitos. From the Greek, melanos, black, and eitos, an eagle. A specific name of the common eagle. Melagris, Latin, a turkey. Membrana, Latin, a membrane. Membrane. A name given to different thin organs representing species of supple, more or less elastic, webs. Membranous. Belonging to membrane. Murgus. From the Latin murgo, I put under water. Generic name of the mergansers. Merops. Latin. A bird that eats bees. Generic name of the bee eaters. Merula. Latin. A black bird. Metacarpus. From the Greek meta, after, and carpus, the wrist. That part of the hand which is between the wrist and fingers. Metatarsus, from the Greek meta, after, and tarsos, the instep. That part of the foot which is between the instep and toes. Migration, the act of going from one country to dwell in another. Migratoria, migratorius, Latin, migratory. Migratory, having the habit of going from one country to sojourn in another during a season. Miliaria, Latin, a bird that feeds upon millet, specific name of the common bunting. Milvus, Latin, a kite. Minor, Latin, less, smaller. Molissima, Latin, softest. Mollusca, from the Latin mollis, soft, a class of marine animals without vertebrae, which have blood vessels, a spinal marrow, and simple body without articulated limbs. Molluscus, belonging to the mollusca. Monedula, Latin, a jackdaw. 
monogamous from the greek monos one and gamos marriage those animals the male and female of which are paired for life are said to be monogamous monogamy from the greek monos one single and gamos marriage the state or condition of being married only to one person Motachila, latin a wagtail mouette french a sea mew a gull molt to change the feathers molting changing of the plumage which occurs naturally and periodically musicapa from the latin musca a fly and capio i seize flycatcher musicus latin belonging or relating to music mustaches from the greek mustax the upper lip the beard on the upper lip the beard that is permitted to grow long on the upper lip the hairs which many animals have growing about the mouth myothera from the greek mus a mouse and therao i hunt i catch the systematic name of the ant catchers the word would better be myrmothera from myrmex an ant and therao naris latin the nostrils natation from the latin natatio swimming the act of swimming or supporting oneself or moving upon the water nectar from the greek nectar which is formed from ne a negative and ktao i kill because nectar imparted immortality the drink of the heathen gods a certain product of flowers which is found in the corolla but which does not belong to it nictitans latin winking the membrana nictitans is a sort of internal eyelid found in many mammals and in all birds nidification from the latin nidos a nest and facere to make the act of building a nest niger nigra latin black nisus latin a sparrow hawk noctua latin an owl nocturne systematic name of nocturnal birds of prey nostrils linear when they are extended lengthwise in a line with the beak as in divers etc nostrils pervious when they are open and may be seen through from side to side as in gulls etc nove hollandiae latin of new holland numida latin a guinea fowl numenius from the greek neos nu and mene moon on account of their crescent-shaped beak generic name of the curlews esophagus from the greek aiso i carry and phagian, to eat the gullet the membranous canal which conveys food from the mouth to the stomach aestrus from the greek oistros strong desire incitement a gadfly systematic name of a family of insects omnivorous from the latin omnis all and vorare to eat applied to animals that eat all kinds of food both animal and vegetable anocrotalis from the greek onos an ass and krotos noise systematic name of the pelican operculum latin formed from oper ire to cover the small door or cover which closes the entrance to a shell a bony movable plate which in a great many fishes covers the ears or bronchiae organization the motor manner of a structure of an organized being aureolus from the latin aureolus of the color of gold systematic name of the orioles ornithology from the greek ornis in the genitive case ornithos a bird and logos a discourse the natural history of birds orpha systematic name of a fovitiae ortix from the greek ortux 
A quail. Systematic name of a kind of partridge. Orizivora, Orizivorus. Latin, formed from the Greek, oruza, rice, and the Latin vorare, to eat. Specific names of certain buntings. Os, Latin, a bone. Osifraga, Latin, formed from oesa, bones, and fragare, to break. Name of a kind of vulture. Osifragus, Latin, specific name of an eagle. Ostrilagus, Latin, specific name of an oyster catcher. Otis, Latin, from the Greek oitis, a bustard, generic name of the bustards. Otis, an owl, formed from os, in the genitive otus, an ear, generic name of a kind of owl. Ovary, from the Latin ovum, an egg, the ovaries are the organs in which the eggs are formed in oviparous animals. Oviduct. The duct or canal which leads from the ovaries to the cloaca. Oviparous. From the Latin ovum, an egg, and pare, to bring forth. Animals that multiply by means of eggs are oviparous. End of section 10. Glossary P through Z of the Elements of Ornithology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kayo. The Elements of Ornithology by William Rushenberger. Glossary P through Z. Palati, Latin of the palate. Palmar, from the Latin palma the palm of the hand belonging or relating to the palm also applied to the feet of web-footed birds palmate having a membrane betwixt the toes giving the foot a remote resemblance to the palm palmipedes from the latin palma palm and pes in the genitive pedis a foot systematic name of web-footed birds pangreas from the greek pan all and creas flesh that is quite fleshy a gland deeply seated in the abdomen which resembles the salivary glands in its structure and has been called the abdominal salivary gland pangreatic belonging to the pangreas pandian generic name of the ospreys papa specific name of a vulture papilla latin a nipple a name given to small eminences which appear to be formed by the ultimate expansion of the vessels and nerves papillae plural of papilla papillated covered with papillae paradisea generic name of the birds of paradise paris generic name of the tids passerinae from the latin passer a sparrow the systematic name of migratory birds passerine birds birds of passage patagonica latin belonging or relating to patagonia pavo latin a peacock pecten latin a comb the name given to a folded membrane situated in the back part of the eye in birds destined to regulate the focal distance between the crystalline lens and the sentient surface of the retina pectinate foot from the latin pecten a comb toes fringed like the teeth of a comb pectoral from the latin pectus and the genitive pectoris the chest the breast belonging or relating to the chest pelagica latin belonging or relating to the sea pelicanus latin a pelican pelvis latin a basin the name of the bony structure at the lower part of the trunk which forms the inferior boundary of the abdomen gives support or place a foundation to the spinal column and affords points of articulation for the thigh bones constituting the hip joint 
peninsula from the latin penne almost and insula an island land almost surrounded by water and connected to a continent by a neck of land penultimate from the latin penne almost and ultimus the last that which is immediately next to the last percnoptery the plural of percnopterus percnopterus from the greek perknos spotted and pteron wing systematic name of certain vultures pernis from the greek pernis a certain bird of prey the generic name of the honey buzzards petrel the diminutive of peter the name of a web-footed bird that seems to walk on the water petrus from the greek petra a rock a stone a part of the temporal bone which contains the internal organs of hearing is so called from resembling a stone in hardness phaeton from the greek phaethon brilliant generic name of the tropic bird phalacrocorax from the greek phalacros bald and corax a raven the systematic name of the cormorants which later name is a corruption of the french word corbeau marin sea crow phalanges the plural of phalanx phalanx from the greek phalanx a file of soldiers the bones composing the fingers and toes they are named first second and third phalanges phalaropus from the greek phalaris a coot and pus foot having the lobed feet of the coots systematic name of the phalaropes phalaenae from the greek phalaina a moth of the kind that flutter about lambs systematic name of a family of insects phasianus from the greek phasianos a pheasant so called from the river phasis in colchis near the black sea the systematic name of the pheasants phainicopterus from the greek phoinis red and pteron wing red winged the generic name of the flamingo pica latin a magpie picus latin a woodpecker pictus latin painted speckled spotted polaris latin belonging to anything round the specific name of a thrush pinion the joint of the wing remotest from the body pinnate foot having the edges of the toes scalloped or notched as in the coots pintado spanish mottled generic name of the guinea fowl piscivorus from the latin piscis a fish and vorare to eat fish eating applied to animals that feed on fish platelia latin formed from the greek platus flat the generic name of the spoonbills plotus from greek pluo i swim the generic name of the daughters plover from the latin pluvia rain a bird so called from making its appearance in the rainy season plumage from the latin pluma a soft feather the feathery coat of a bird plume feather of a bird podiceps the generic name of the grebes polygamous from the greek polus many and gamos marriage when animals do not live in pairs but on the contrary an individual is united to several of the opposite sex they are said to be polygamous polyglottus from the greek polus many and glossa tongue many tongued specific name of the mocking bird pretensus latin belonging or relating to a meadow prehensile endowed by the power of seizing hold of applied to certain parts prehension from the latin prehendere to lay hold of the prehension of elements consists in laying hold of and conveying food into the mouth pressurostries from the latin pressus pressed and rostrum beak systematic name of a family of grelatoriae prey food gotten by violence primaries primary quills the largest feathers of the wings procellaria from the latin procella a great tempest at sea systematic name of the petrels prognostic from the greek pro before and gnosko i know i judge a conjuncture or opinion of what is yet to happen 
projectile from the latin boicere to throw in advance or to a distance any heavy body thrown into the air and abandoned to the action of its own weight that which is capable of being cast or thrown forward having the power of sudden extension protractile capable of being drawn out or extended proventriculus from the latin pro before and ventriculus a little stomach the second stomach of birds psitticus from the greek psitta kos a parrot systematic name of parrots sophia from the greek sophia i make a noise systematic name of the trumpeters pulverator from the latin pulverare to cover with dust applied to those birds that wallow in the dust pijargus from the greek puge behind and argos white a bird of prey with a white tail pelorus from the greek pule a gate and oros a guardian the lower or right orifice of the stomach pergita generic name of the sparrows perula generic name of the bullfinches quiscalus generic name of the blackbirds radius latin a spoke so called from its shape one of the bones of the forearm rallus generic name of the rails remphestos from the greek rumphos a beak generic name of the toucans rapaces from the latin rapax ravenous devouring systematic name of the order of birds of prey retrices from the latin rectrix a governess the long feathers of the tail which serve to steer the bird recurviostra from the latin recurvo i bent back and rostrum beak systematic name of birds whose beaks are curved upwards regimen diet regulus latin diminutive of rex a king a wren regurgitate the return of food to the mouth after it has been once swallowed religiosa latin religious remiges the strong feathers of the wings reticulated in the form of the meshes of a net made of network retractile having the quality of being drawn back rhea specific name of an ostrich rinchops from the greek rinkos beak a snout the systematic name of the skimmers rodentia from the latin rodere to gnaw the systematic name of an order of mammals reutlet french diminutive of roi king a wren ruber latin red rubicula specific name of the stone chat rufus latin reddish yellow rubicula from the latin rupes the genitive rupees a rock and colere to inhabit generic name of cocks of the rock rustica latin rustic belonging to the country rusticula specific name of the woodcock sarcoramphus from the greek sarx in the genitive sarkos flesh and rumphe knife cutting flesh like a knife generic name of a kind of vulture saxicola from the latin sexus a rock and colere to inhabit systematic name of a genus of warblers scansoriae formed from the latin scando i climb systematic name of the order of climbing birds scapula the shoulder blade scapulars scapularis the feathers that take their rise from the shoulders and cover the sides of the back scolopax from the greek scolopax a snipe generic name of the snipe scops from the greek scope an owl the systematic name of an owl scotulated legs formed from the latin scutum a shield having the tarsi covered with scaly plates secondaries those quill that rise from the second bones of the wing sedentary not migratory serpentarius latin belonging or relating to serpents 
specific name of the secretary or serpent bird serrated from the latin zera a saw notched or toothed like a saw sita from the greek sito i cry generic name of the nut hedges somateria systematic name of the eider sterna systematic name of the terns or sea swallows sternum the breastbone strix latin an owl struthio from the greek struthion an ostrich systematic name of the ostrich sternus latin a starling styloid from the greek stulos a style a peg a pin and eidos resemblance shape shape like a peg or pin subutio from the latin sub under next after and buteo a kind of hawk specific name of a falcon submaxillary from the latin sub under and maxilla jaw that which is beneath the jaw sula from the greek sula plunder booty generic name of the boobies sylvia generic name of certain warblers syndactyle from the greek syn together and dactylos toe having the toes joined systematic name of a family of passerine birds cernium from the greek cernion an owl systematic name of the hooting owls tachypetes from the greek tachys swift and petomai to fly systematic name of the frigate bird talon the claw of a bird or prey tenegra systematic name of the tanagers tarda latin slow tardy tarsi plural of tarsus tarsus from greek tarsos any row the sole of the foot the posterior part of the foot which in man consists of seven bones and forms the heel and instep Tectiform, from the Latin tectum, roof of a house, and forma, form, roof-shaped. Tegumentary, from the Latin tegumen, a covering, belonging or relating to the tegument or skin. Tenere rostris, from the Latin tenuis, slender, and rostrum, beak, systematic name of a family of passerine birds. Tetro, Latin, a bustard, systematic name of grouse. Tetrax, greek systematic name of the bustard thorax from the greek thorax the chest it is bounded posteriorly by the vertebrae laterally by the ribs and scapula anteriorly by the sternum above by the clavicle and below by the diaphragm it is destined to lodge and protect the chief organs of respiration and circulation the lungs and heart thoracic belonging to the thorax tibia latin a flute the largest bone of the leg is so called tichodroma systematic name of certain creepers torda specific name of a kind of auk torquilla from the latin torqueo i writhe i twist systematic name of the rhinac totipalmate from the latin totus the hole and palma the palm systematic name of a family of web-footed birds trachea from the greek trachus rough and arteria an artery which is formed from air air and terrain to keep the canal which conveys the air to the lungs the windpipe trenchant cutting tristis latin sad sorrowful trochilus systematic name of the hummingbirds troglodytes from the greek trogle cavern or hole and dao i enter systematic name of the wrens trunk the body without including the head or extremities the proboscis of an elephant truncated cut short cut abruptly or square off tubercle from the latin tuber a knot a small knot or projection turdus latin a thrush tyrannus latin a tyrant ulna the bone of the forearm which forms the prominence of the elbow during the flexion of that joint ulnar relating to the ulna ulula latin an owl umbellus latin specific name of the rough grouse upupa latin a hoopoe orbica latin 
belonging or relating to a city ureter the tube or canal which passes from the kidney to the bladder Aurea, generic name of the guillemot urogallus specific name of the great heathcock valesneria generic name of an aquatic plant channel wheat upon which the canvasback ducks feed and to which the peculiar and delicious flavour of their flesh is said to be attributable the specific name of the canvas back duck vanillus generic name of the lapwing vellum latin a veil ventricle the second stomach of a bird is so called versicolor latin changing colour of various colours vertebra from the latin vertere to turn this name has been given to each of the bones which by their union form the vertebral or spinal column vulgarly called the backbone vertebrae the plural of vertebra vertebral belonging or relating to vertebrae vertebrata animals that possess vertebrae the first branch of the animal kingdom vertebrate having vertebrae vestibule from the latin vestibulum vestibule a room at the entrance of an edifice which only serves as a passage to other apartments the first part of the second cavity of the ear is so called vibrissae hairs that stand forward like feelers in some birds they are slender as in flycatchers etc and point both upwards and downwards from both the upper and under sides of the mouth virginiana virginianus latin belonging to virginia viscera the plural of viscous viscous any bowel or entrail or internal part as the heart liver lungs pancreas etc viscirorus systematic name of a thrush vociferous latin vociferous noisy crowing vulture latin a vulture vulturinus latin belonging or relating to a vulture wattle the loose red flesh that hangs below a cock's bill yunx from the greek yunx the wryneck generic name of the wryneck zoological belonging or relating to zoology zoology from the greek zoon an animal and logos a discourse that part of natural history which treats of animals zygodactyle from the greek zygos a balance and dactylos a toe a systematic name of the order of climbers end of glossary end of the elements of ornithology by william rushenberger